Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto trained by Ibiki for Chunin exams harem. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Mbrigger and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1, Marino Ibiki was not having a good day. His talents weren't needed at the moment, all his drinking buddies were out on missions, his favorite sake bar was closed for repairs, and rent on his apartment was due. Add this on top of his usual grumpy exterior, and it was no wonder people were getting out of his way. His apartment was close, so he funneled some chakra into his legs, leapt across two rooftops, and started in through his window, until he heard the telltale grunts and taunts of the fight. Ibiki jumped down to the alley behind his apartment building and saw a set of people kicking something on the ground. He didn't know what they were kicking, but he knew whenever six people were around one thing kicking it on the ground, it generally wasn't good. Ibiki stalked towards the group who still hadn't noticed his presence, getting a better look at what they were kicking. His killer intent started spiking with each step as he realized that they were kicking the tar out of a kid. He couldn't have been eight years old. Ibiki growled as he lifted his fist and knocked the first person into the wall of the alley. The second person was backhanded in a similar manner before the other four even began to react. That was when he got really mad. One of the people he was fighting was a Chuanan. It was horrible to find something like this taking place, but to have a ninja of his own village take part in it was just disgusting. Ibiki chose the Chuanan as his next target as the villagers realized just who it was and tried to run. Ibiki wasn't too concerned if they got away, he had gotten good looks at their faces and they wouldn't get away from the situation without some kind of punishment. But right now, he was dealing with a ninja who would defile the principles of his village like this. The Chuanan drew a kunai and that was all that Ibiki needed. Ibiki stepped into Chuanin's strike and slammed a fist into his face, breaking his nose, and stripped him of the kunai, sliding it into his own kunai pouch. The other three had run off, but Ibiki had gotten a good look at their faces. They would be getting a visit from him, but right now, he had more important things to worry about. Such as a beaten kid at his feet. Ibiki used a binding jutsu on the three unconscious people littering the alley, making sure that even in the unlikely event that they woke up, they wouldn't be going anywhere. After that was done, he turned back and was surprised. Marino Ibiki was not a man who was easily surprised. He had seen a lot of things that would shock many people speechless. He didn't get assigned as the second in command of the Anbu's torture and interrogation squad for nothing, and he was going to be the one who took it over once the current head retired. But what he was seeing now was truly surprising. The six or seven year old kid, the kid he had just seen getting beat by six full grown men, was getting back up. The bear sized man moved over to the blonde haired kid and placed a steadying hand on his shoulder, only to have it shrugged off. Easy kid. You shouldn't move right now, not until someone's checked you out to make sure you don't have any serious injuries. The blonde haired kid, who Ibiki had finally recognized as the Kaiubi container, scowled. I'm fine. I've never had anybody help me like that before, and I've always done fine before. Besides, I'm Yuzumaki Naruto and I'm going to be Hokage. Ibiki chuckled. Well, if you can take a beating like that and get back up, you might be able to pull that off. Don't get your hopes up though. Now stop moving while I make sure you aren't too injured. Naruto muttered, but didn't move. Being a specialist in torture, a lot of people wouldn't have thought that Ibiki would know much about taking pain away. But for those that thought about it, it made sense. One of the best techniques for getting information was putting someone on death's door, then bringing him or her back. And the best way to make sure you didn't inadvertently kill someone was to have a serious knowledge of anatomy. So while Ibiki wasn't going to be a medic nin anytime soon, he knew how to fix someone up long enough to get them to someone who was able to really heal them. Okay, you're good to move around, but you'll want to get looked at after we get where we're going. Where are we going? Naruto asked. To see the Hokage. The old man. I guess so. Ibiki kept his normal face, but inside he was laughing. He'd never seen anyone be so disrespectful to the Hokage, but this kid did it without thinking. He said it like he would call the Hokage that to his face. But no one was that dense. The Hokage will see you now, the Chunin outside the Sandame's office said to Ibiki and Naruto, who were waiting after dropping off Naruto's attackers in some of Ibiki's cells. They entered the office to see the Hokage lighting his pipe with a minor Katen Jutsu. Ah, Naruto-kun, what are you doing here? And with Ibiki-kun no less. You haven't been pulling pranks again, have you? Though Saratobi's words were chiding, he was smiling. Hey old man. Why do you always think I'm pulling pranks? Ibiki forced himself to keep from reacting. The kid actually does call the most powerful person in Kanoha old man. Perhaps because you are always pulling pranks. Naruto just laughed sheepishly and rubbed the back of his head. Ibiki was still running off his anger at the people who could do such a thing. Hokage-sama, this is more serious than a simple prank. Yes, I thought it might have been when you brought him to see me. So what is the cause for this visit? 
Okajama, I was on my way home when I heard the sounds of a fight. When I went to investigate, I found Naruto here being beaten up by five villagers and a Chuanan. The Sandame's face hardened. Naruto-kun, is this true? Well, I don't know if he was a Chuanan, but I know one of them had a hit I ate on his forehead. And I didn't prank them or anything. I was just trying to buy some food when they started chasing after me, calling me demon brat and stuff like that. But I don't want anyone to get into trouble because of me. Saratobi interrupted before Naruto could get too far into his apology or aunt. Don't worry Naruto-kun, it wasn't anything you did. Any punishment they receive is entirely because of their own actions. But I think I need to talk to Ibiki-kun alone for a moment. Please wait out in the hall until I call you back in. Okay old man, but do you think we can go get some Raymon after this is done? Saratobi chuckled. We'll see Naruto-kun. Alright. Raymon here I come. Ibiki just stared at the door after it shut until the Hokage cleared his throat, bringing him back to the present. What happened? Like I said, I was going home, I was about to go in my window, and then I heard a fight. I found six people kicking the shit out of a seven-year-old, and then I stopped them. Just how did you stop them? I didn't kill them if that's what you're asking. I knocked out two of the villagers, the Chuanin, and got a good look at the other three. I would have tracked them down, but I was more concerned with the bloody lump at my feet. Much to my surprise, he wasn't a bloody lump, but already standing up and actually in pretty good shape for what had just happened to him. Now I know what he has sealed in him, but he shouldn't have to take a beating like that. He shouldn't be able to take a beating like that. I completely agree. Ibiki scowled. Then why does he? Suratobi sighed. I really wish the Hokage was as powerful as people think he is. But I can't change people's minds, and if I try to get too close to him personally, people will say the Kaiubi has corrupted me, and my resignation would be called for then I wouldn't be able to help him at all. So, I do what I can and hope that people will overcome their feelings and see the boy as he is. I wouldn't count on that. People are going to be stupid no matter what you say or outlaw them from saying. They don't realize that if he really was the fox, they'd all be dead by now. I know. What did you do with the three you knocked out? They're waiting for me in some of the holding cells. I'll deal with them in the morning. Does Naruto even know why he was being chased? He should know, if only to know why he's shunned. And you heard him, he didn't want anyone to get into trouble, even after they beat him up. I doubt he's going to go seeking revenge just because he knows why. I'm not sure that's the best idea, I wanted him to have a normal childhood. He took a six-man beating and got back up like it was an everyday occurrence. That's not a normal childhood, no matter who you are. I'll do what you tell me, but I think he should know. The Hokage sighed and stayed silent for a moment. Bring Naruto-kun back in here, and I'll talk to him. But don't interrupt. Ibiki nodded and brought the energetic blonde back into the room. Naruto-kun, I have something to tell you, but it may upset you. Alright old man, what is it? Before I tell you, I want your word that you will try not to get too upset and listen to the entire story before you do anything. Is this really that big? Yes, Naruto-kun. Okay, I'll try not to go nuts and I'll listen to the whole thing. What do you know of the Kyubi no Kitsune and its defeat? Naruto quickly assumed his thinking pose and gave the basic telling of how the Yandame killed this demon fox at the cost of his own life. Yes, that is almost what happened. Naruto scrunched up his face. What do you mean? The Kaiubi no Kitsune was the strongest demon in existence, the strongest of the Biju. Nothing could kill it, not even the fourth Hokage. But the fox was beaten, and if it wasn't killed, what happened? Wouldn't it come back to finish us off? I don't know. I don't know why the fox attacked us, and I doubt we ever will. But while the fourth did defeat the Kaiubi, he wasn't able to kill it. Instead, he used a sealing technique that would trap the Kaiubi in a human vessel, protecting Kanoha from harm. Unfortunately, the only way to keep the Kaiubi from destroying its vessel was to use a newborn baby whose chakra pathways were not yet developed. That way, the body could use the demon's chakra and grow to adapt to it instead of being killed by it. So why didn't we get told this? Why is it a big secret? Because while the Yandane wanted the Kaiubi's vessel to be seen as a hero for protecting the village from certain destruction, the villagers could only see the fox when they looked at the vessel. Someone who killed the Yandame and their loved ones. So I was forced to create a law that prohibited anyone from speaking of what happened to anyone who didn't know the truth. I wanted the vessel to have a normal childhood. Unfortunately, I failed you in that aspect, Naruto-kun. Naruto may be one of the densest people in the village and certainly not one of the most intelligent, but he wasn't stupid. So with all the information given, his seven-year-old mind could only come up with one thing. I'm the Kaiubi vessel, aren't I? He asked in a small voice, one that was strange coming from the usually loud boy. I'm sorry that it was easier, but yes, you are the one who had the Kaiubi sealed into him. Naruto sat in his thinking pose, looking rather run down, as if the beating he had taken earlier was just now taking its toll. After a few minutes of silence, he spoke. He had to do it, didn't he? 
between one life or the entire village, he had to make the choice that he made. You're taking this much better than I thought you would be, Saratobi said slowly, testing Naruto's reaction. What am I supposed to do about it now? There wasn't any other way to win, and he made the right choice for the village, which is what the Hokage is supposed to do. And since I'm going to be Hokage someday, I need to understand that. I don't like it, but he did what he had to do to protect his precious people. The Hokage smiled. I'm glad you understand. Now, you need to understand that what I've told you is a S-class secret, and it would be a bad thing if people found out. However, my law doesn't affect you, so anyone you want to tell you may, but I want you to know that you should be careful. You are not a demon, and you know this. However, some people do not see it that way, and those who you tell might not understand if you tell them. So you need to take caution. Okay. Can we go get some Raymond now? Tsuritobi laughed. Unfortunately, I have a great deal of paperwork to finish. But if you ask nicely, perhaps you could persuade Ibiki Kun to take you. Naruto immediately rounded to face the scarred man. Please, please take me to get some Raymond, I'll be good, and Ichiraku's is so good, and I'll even help pay and Ibiki cut the small boy off. Just shut up and come on. Ibiki would have rather just gone and gotten drunk to try to forget the ignorance of people in Konoha, but he had seen the Hokage's smile, and he knew he had no choice. Besides, he had the feeling the blonde would pester him until he said yes anyway. Hey old man, another bowl of pork Raymond. Ibiki had been stunned and surprised more tonight than he had been than he had been for a long time. But the sheer amount of Raymond the seven-year-old was simply astonishing. There was no place for the food to go, but Naruto simply kept eating. He didn't know how. Naruto was currently at 18 bowls and counting. Alright kid, I think you've had enough. Not to mention I don't have any more money. Let's get you home. Hein, Naruto mumbled, saying how he wanted more Raymond. I'm not going to have you eat your way through my paycheck, even if you do want more Raymond. Now let's go. Ibiki and Naruto walked the short distance from Ichiraku's to his apartment, where Ibiki felt his anger rise at the state of it. You mean the people you live with let their place get like this? Naruto looked around at his apartment, the only thing different from how it was normally, was that there was a new rock that sat amongst the shards of a freshly broken window. He picked up a rock and set it over with the others, not even bothering with a note on it. He looked back up at the scarred Jounin. Actually, this isn't that bad. The power's on at least. And what do you mean people I live with? You mean the people in the other apartments or something? You live here by yourself. Naruto hesitated. Uh, yeah. But I can take of myself. Ibiki scowled. He wasn't normally this helpful to anyone, but quite frankly, not many people deserved help as much as this kid. And nobody deserved to live here. Hell, his interrogation cells were nicer than this apartment. Fuck it. Kid, grab some clothes for tomorrow and come with me. I'm not going to have you living in a shithole like this one if I can help it. Naruto stared at the large man blankly. Uh, okay. Naruto grabbed a change of clothes, then the unlikely pair set out towards Ibiki's apartment. Ibiki was definitely upset by the glares the villagers were giving the blonde beside him, only to advert their eyes when they saw whom he was with. Though some continued their arrogance and looked at Ibiki with praise in their eyes, as if they thought Ibiki was taking him to one of his interrogation rooms. That simply disgusted him that people of his own village could think that way. The thing that cut him the worst was that Naruto seemed used to it. Hell, Naruto wasn't just used to it, he was moving like absolutely nothing was wrong or out of the ordinary, like this was something that happened to everyone. Ibiki reigned in his killing intent, Naruto was looking at him funny. Sadistic torturer he may be, but he didn't like messing with kids like that. You said you wanted to be Hokage, right? Ibiki asked. At Naruto's fervent nod, he continued. Then you need to be a decent ninja first. Higurashi's is the best place in Konoha for equipment. Naruto whooped and started to do a dance, but quickly followed after Ibiki when he wasn't being waited for. After a few minutes of looking around, meaning Naruto was staring at all the weapons in awe, a shop clerk approached them. Ibiki-san, it's good to see you again. What can I do to help you? Then the clerk noticed exactly who was with Ibiki, and his face fell. It didn't turn into a sneer or grimace like some of the others Ibiki had seen that morning, but it definitely told him Naruto wasn't particularly welcome. Ibiki saw this and immediately pulled him off to the side, so Naruto wouldn't overhear them. Um, Ibiki-san, is it truly wise to have him here? Why? Is there something wrong with him that would cause a problem, Higurashi-san? He's no more trouble than any other seven-year-old. The worst he might do is pull a prank, and he knows not to do anything of the sort. Higurashi held up his hands quickly. I have no problem with the boy myself, but I have to look out for my family. Ibiki's scowl deepened. No, no, not like that, it's just you know this shop is my family's only source of income since I retired. Well I don't see anything wrong with the boy, some of my customers might not see it that way, and I can't afford to lose too many. I'm looking out for my family's best interests. This is a shop for shinobi equipment. 
which means the only people who need to be shopping here are shinobi. And if a shinobi can't get over stupid prejudices, I'm not sure I'd want to associate with them. Anyone with half a brain knows that boy is not the demon, and if he was, Kanoha would have been destroyed ten times over for the crap he's been put through here. The Girashi looked shocked. What do you mean? I know some people don't like the boy, but it can't really have been that bad, could it? Last night, he was getting beaten up by six people, and who knows what would have happened if I hadn't stopped them. Later that night, he was treating life like everything was normal, and it was a common occurrence. With these people, it probably was. And besides, his dream is to become Hokage. I told him this was the best place for equipment in Kanoha. I doubt he'll want to go anywhere else now. Not to mention your daughter seems to have taken a liking to him already. Ibiki nodded over to where Naruto and a girl with chocolate brown hair done up in buns on top of her head were talking. Hey, I'm Tenten, do you need some help? Naruto started at Tenten's voice, due mainly to not being used to people talking in a pleasant tone to him. Um, yeah. Ibiki brought me here to get some stuff, but he didn't tell me what it was, so I kinda have to wait for him. He's over there talking with that guy. Tenten smiled. That's my dad. This is his shop, and it's got the best weapons anywhere. All the best ninjas shop here. Yeah, well, I'm not just going to be a ninja, I'm gonna be Hokage, the best ninja in the whole village. You're a little short to be Hokage, aren't you? Naruto scowled. I'm not short, and I am going to be Hokage. Nobody's going to stop me. Fine, but I'm going to be able to beat you. I'm going to be the best Kanoichi ever. Just like Tsunade Sama. Who's she? Denton's face went slack in a dumbfounded expression. What do you mean, who's she? What do you mean, what do I mean? I don't know who she is, and I was asking you to tell me so I would know. That's what I was asking. Tsunade Sama is only the best Kanoichi alive, one of the legendary Sanin, and the best medic nin ever. She could probably take over for the Hokage when he retires. No she couldn't, because I'm going to be Hokage. Fenton sighed, exasperated with the Hokage hopeful. The Hokage is old, and you're still little. Even if you do become Hokage, she'll take over when the Sandame retires. Maybe you could get it when she retires. Naruto's face took on one of slow comprehension. Yeah, and I'll get even better when she's Hokage. So, you want to be friends. I guess so, but I've never had a friend before. What do we do? Before Naruto could learn exactly what friends do, Ibiki and Tenten's father wandered over. So, I've been talking with Ibiki-san, and I understand you want to be a ninja. Best to start out early, I always say. Alright, I'd say he needs two sets of starter shuriken and kunai, blunted so he doesn't kill himself, and some weights would be good too. Build up his speed so he can get away from the shit he gets in. Igarashi Sadam nodded. Tenten, can you go in the back and get the shuriken and kunai for me? At her nod, he turned back to Ibiki. So, do you want to have simple arm and leg weights, or did you want to go with a full weighted suit? Ibiki looked Naruto over. A, go with both. Just little ones to start out with, but make sure you can add to them, he might get used to them pretty quick. Saddam shrugged. Usually people go with one or the other, but if you're sure he walked off to get the correct weights. After finishing up their shopping, it was getting late, so Ibiki took Naruto back to their apartment, told him to stay in there, and not open the door for anyone, including himself. He had a key to let himself in, whereas someone disguised as him wouldn't. Ibiki didn't really think anyone would be stupid enough to try to get into his apartment, but if there were, he wasn't going to let Naruto make it easier for someone using a basic henge. Once that was done, he headed towards the bar to get properly sloshed. He needed to forget the villagers' reactions to Naruto. While Ibiki was getting drunk, Naruto was sleeping, having a nice dream about him throwing his shuriken, defeating his enemies, being raised up as Hokage, and being hailed as a Raymond god. As he stood in the Hokage's office, looking out over Kanoha, the dream swirled. As the area around Naruto regained shape, he was standing in a dank hallway, pipes dripping, and a low rumble coming from the end of the hallway. Naruto took a tentative step forward and jumped when he heard a voice speaking to him. Hey Brad, get down here. Naruto slowly crept towards the voice, coming from the direction of the rumbling. Hurry up, I don't feel like waiting, you little ape Brad. Naruto jumped again and rushed forward, emerging in a room that dwarfed him, making him feel truly small. There were bars separating the room, a large seal covering the center. But he froze at the sight of the gigantic red eyes, glowing in the darkness. Naruto knew what this was, the Kaiubi no Kitsune. Naruto felt the eyes concentrate on his body, and there was blast of wind as the demon snorted in disgust. I still can't believe I got sealed in something so damn little. Blue eyes flashed as Naruto shook off his shock. Hey, I'm not little. Take that back. A loud yapping sound filled the air, a sound Naruto took his laughter. You've got guts, I'll give you that, to talk back to the Lord of Demons like that. As for the little comment, I'm not going to take that back, it's the truth. Stupid human, before I ended up here, I was able to destroy a mountain with a single swipe of one of my tails. Compared to my former glory, you're tiny. 
Naruto didn't have a response to that and settled for a scowl. What am I doing here? I needed to talk to you. And seeing as how you know about me now, now would be a good time. I would have done it sooner, but quite frankly, I didn't need you hearing voices and thinking you were crazy. If you were to do something like try to carve the voices out of your head, that would end up bad for the both of us. You die, I die. I don't want to die, so don't do something stupid and get yourself killed. Got that. I don't want to die either. But what do I get out of it? I will be laughed again, harder than before. You know, you're one of the only humans ever to ask me for anything, and the only one stupid enough to do so in such a tone. But what do you get out of it? Stupidly large chakra reserves and increased healing, that's what. Maybe something else if you impress me. Don't count on it though. If not for me helping you out, you would have died several times over from the beatings those idiotic villagers give you. Naruto shuffled his feet before replying. Thank you, he muttered. What? Kaiubi asked, actually sounding bewildered. Naruto looked the demon fox directly in the eyes, his own glinting with determination. I said, thank you if someone saves your life, you're supposed to thank them. Even if they're a bastard fox that got you in the trouble to begin with. The room was silent, save for the constant growling that came from the red-eyed prisoner. You're fucking confusing, brat. Eloquent as always, Naruto replied, huh? I will be sighed, or at least that's what it sounded like to the blonde. You're confusing as hell. No, no, hell's fairly straightforward. Lots of torture and pain. Bunch of fire. But you have the balls to insult me, yell at me, you don't fear me, at least not near as much as anyone with good sense, and then you turn around and thank me. You're confusing, even to someone who's lived as long as me. Well, if you can call being stuck behind a seal living. I already said it. You saved my life, and that deserves a thank you, even if you did it just to keep yourself alive. You make my life hell, but it's not like you asked to be stuck in my belly. Yondame did that. So he gets his share of the blame. As for me insulting you, you're touchy and deserved it anyway. As loath as I am to admit it, that attitude probably means we'll get on better than either one of us thought. Damn it. The two glared at each other before Naruto broke the silence. I've got a question. Why did you attack Konoha? You know, the only other person to ask me that was your pops, Kaiubi said in a thoughtful tone. And my dad. Naruto choked out. Yeah. That blonde prick that sealed me in here. Unsurprisingly, also the only other person to look at me like you do. Determination to the point of a death wish and very little fear. The reason is very simple. I was asked to. Who would ask you to do that? The Kami. The Biju are incredible demons, but unlike other demons, we do clean up work when shit goes bad. Though we probably wouldn't do it if not for the fact that Kami could beat all nine of us with his arms tied behind his back and blindfolded and still not break a sweat. Crazy person about to destroy the world. We get orders to go eat them. Everybody else passes it off as us just being demons. Happened a long time ago when you stupid humans got too advanced and power obsessed for your own good, and all nine of us had to be called in. Took out damn near the whole race before we got called off. What do you mean too advanced and power obsessed? I mean you stupid ape rats creating shit that would kill everything on the planet with the push of a button and threatening to use it over petty differences. And you wonder why demons hate you. But why did that mean you were called in to attack us? Kanoha doesn't have anything that could do anything like that. Well, you finally seem to be using that little brain of yours. We get called in whenever something gets too big for you to deal with or when one of you stupid ape rats gets too close to breaking the natural order of things. Kanoha had that in the shape of a snake bastard called Orochimaru. Not too close to immortality for comfort, so I was called in to stop him, considering this village is in my territory. Orochimaru? I've heard villagers say things about him. But he's a missing nin now. He got jazzed out before you attacked. I know that now. But Kanoha was where the kami told me to attack. So that's where I thought he was. Of course, after being sealed in you, I'm not sure that wasn't his plan all along. Maybe he's got something big planned for you. But when your shinobi started to attack me, that was more proof that you were hiding Orochimaru to keep him from killing him. As for eating the ones who attacked me, I was hungry. So you were just doing your job when you attacked us. An absolute oversimplification of what was actually divine punishment, but yes. So was there any other reason why you interrupted my dreams? I'd like to get back to them. I would be growled. Listen brat, I may be stuck in this cage, but I'll be damned if I let you talk like that for too long. I'm still a hell of a lot more powerful than you and can make your life hell. Naruto jumped up, interrupting the Biju's rant. You already do, or don't you remember all the shit the villagers put me through? You make my life hell, and anything else you throw at me, I'll overcome it. Sit down. Kaiubi roared. Yes, your life sucks. Yes, people are mean to you. I'd like to do something about that, but I can't. So stop complaining and show me a little respect. You'd really do something about it if you could. I may be a demon, but I've got honor. More honor than most demons and definitely more than most humans. 
I don't like innocents getting hurt. And you, brat, are an innocent in this situation. You technically prevent the people of your village from dying every day, and you get shafted because of something that's not your fault. I don't like that. Be weird. What? Be weird. You bounce back and forth way too much. I've been alive longer than you can comprehend. I've seen more than you will ever know. I have my own reasons why I am the way I am. So are we done? I don't feel much like talking to you anymore, but there is something you should know. Don't bother trying to talk to me day to day. I don't need people thinking you're crazy talking to yourself. The only time we can communicate like this is when you're asleep, unconscious, or if you're specifically meditating to talk to me. Now get out. And with a final snort, Naruto was blown out of the room and awake, staring at the scarred man who had taken him in. Did, wake up. We've got some stuff we need to do today, Ibiki said as Naruto blinked the sleep from his eyes. Was it? Get up before I dump you out of the bed. I need to go into work today, and you need to get signed up for the academy. At that, Naruto started moving much faster. He definitely wanted to be in the academy. After a short breakfast and walking across the village, Ibiki and Naruto were waiting in the sign-up line, some of the other parents throwing the blonde dirty looks. Once they finally got up to the front of the line and got Naruto's name on the list a young Chuanin named Aruka was manning, it was later than Ibiki had planned on. But that didn't stop someone from calling out to him. Ibiki-san. I didn't know you had a kid. The scarred man turned and saw a familiar man with long blonde hair waving at him. Anoichi, didn't expect to see you here. Wasn't your kid going to own your flower shop? Ibiki didn't hold anything against Anoichi for being in the flower business, it was part of his family, and hell, it was how he met his wife. The blonde chuckled. She is, but apparently she's also going to be the best Kanoichi of her generation, if you can go by her words. Ibiki smirked. If we're going by what they say, I'm dealing with the future Hokage. Anoichi smiled mischievously. So who's the kid? I know you don't have a woman in your life, and even if you were able to hide that from me, there's no way you'd be able to hide the fact that you made a new addition to Gene Pool. Inoichi looked down at Naruto once more, taking in whom it was. Only a trained Jounin such as Ibiki would have noticed the shift in Inoichi's face, but it was there. Then the blonde made a slight hand gesture that signified that he wanted to speak in private. Figuring it would be good to nip this in the bud, Ibiki went with him. After Ibiki set up a personalized privacy jutsu, Inoichi opened his mouth, but Ibiki cut him off. Before you say anything about he who is in his stomach, you need to get that out of your mind right now. Do you want to know how I met him? Yes, I'd like to know what you're doing with a demon boy. You know, I thought you were smarter than that. He's not a demon boy. If he was as you say he is, we'd all be dead. Last night, I was going home, and I hear a fight. Not one to turn down a fight, I go looking, and I find the kid taking a six-man beating. I put a stop to it, and then he got up and told me he had never had any help before, and that he was going to be Hokage. Then, once we were in the Hokage's office, he said that he was trying to buy some food when they started chasing him. After taking a six-man beating, for no reason other than something he can't control, do you know what he said? He didn't want any of them to get into trouble because of what he did. Does that sound anything like what a demon would do in his spot? No, Inoichi admitted grudgingly. And tell me, if he really is as you say he is, would you say it's a good idea to treat him like shit? Because I don't think treating a demon like shit is a good way to stay alive. I know that but every time I see him, I remember my brother and how he died in the attack, and I can't help but get angry, Inoichi protested. Both my parents and my little brother, the same way, but I don't blame him. Don't hate the jailer for the inmate's crimes. It's stupid and petty, and I thought you were above it. Think it over, and talk to me later. With that, Ibiki released the jutsu and walked off with Naruto. Naruto sat down in front of the Hokage, intent on telling him what he had talked about with Kaiubi the night before, but one question was plaguing his mind. Hey old man, what do you know about my parents? The man called the professor looked up. Why do you ask? I, um, had an interesting conversation last night. With whom? Please don't be mad. The Kaiubi. Suratobi's face hardened. Is the seal weakening? Do you feel any different than normal? What did the Kaiubi say? I don't think the seal's weakening, but I don't know what it would feel like if it was though. I don't feel any different, but I just got signed up for the Ninja Academy, so that's pretty cool. And Kaiubi was kind of rude and called me a bunch of names and told me why he attacked back then and that we were stuck together until I die and he wants to keep living, so I better stay alive. But he also said that my dad was the Yondame. I would like to check the seal after we're done talking and it's good to hear that you got in. As for the Kaiubi, this is interesting. He really said that your father was the Yondame. Naruto screwed his face up in concentration, a comical sight if there ever was one. Well, he didn't come out and say it. I asked him why he attacked, and he said that the only other person who ever asked was my dad. Then I asked about my dad, and he said that it was that blonde prick that sealed me in here or something like that. That's all he said about it. 
I look into this, and while it may explain a number of things, I don't want to get your hopes up. What things would it explain? Naruto asked, genuinely curious. Such as where Arashi got a baby at the last second. Why you look so much like the fourth at his age. You see, Yandane was ready to make any sacrifice for his people, and this is something that he would have done. He would not have wanted to take another person's child over his own. He would not have wanted to do this to anyone, but if anyone, it would be with his own son. He would have believed you strong enough to continue on no matter the circumstances, just as he did. But again, I don't know if this is true. And for that, I am sorry. I do wish I could tell you more, if only to give you a little peace. Naruto was silent for a long moment, and then he looked up. I think I understand. He put his people first. That's what a Hokage needs to do. I'm glad you understand that now. If you are going to be Hokage as you say, it's a very important lesson. About the other thing we Kai Ubi attacked. Did you want to hear about that? Sandame smiled. Yes, I think I would appreciate that greatly. Well, even though Kai Ubi was always throwing out insults, I don't think he was lying, so that's the only reason I'm telling you. He said he was doing his job. That whenever humans get too close to something that's truly forbidden or going to destroy the world or something, him and the other Biju go out and stop it for the Kami. He attacked Kanoha because someone was getting too close to immortality, which is apparently a big no-no or something. Someone called Arachimaru or something. Arachimaru? Saratobi clarified, his voice steel. Yeah, that was it. I see. Well, we'll just have to add that to the list of his crimes. Causing the near destruction of Kanoha. He really is one of my greatest mistakes, the Hokage said, mostly to himself. If there's not anything else, I have a great deal of paperwork, but I'm sure we'll see each other again soon. I thought about what you said. Ibiki looked up from his sake and saw Inoichi sitting next to him. Two days. Here I thought you wouldn't be back before a week. Ha ha. I wanted to make sure I had everything straight in my head first. Nothing straight in that head of yours. You've been screw loose forever. It's all that mind jumping you do. Was everything you said really true? It's probably worse than I told you. For as loud as that kid is, it's hard to get him to open up about the things you want him to. Inoichi put his hand over his heart in mock shock. Marino Ibiki. The great interrogator. Bested by a child. Ibiki fixed him with a glare. I want the kid to trust me. The only person he does even somewhat is Hokage-sama, and that's it. A seven-year-old shouldn't be that paranoid. Even if you're going to raise him. The interrogator scowled. Don't even think about messing with me over this. You didn't see the shithole that kid was living in. The rats had sense to move out. He was happy the power was connected. I wasn't going to make fun of you. I was just saying that you aren't the definition of trusting either. Neither of us can be, but he's worse than me, and it's seven. It's wrong, and it needs to stop. I intend to help. I talked with Shikaku and Choza about it, and after they told me I was being an idiot for thinking the way I was, they said they were on your side. I'm not over my issues with him, but I'm working on it. And we'll help you with the kid when you need it. Kami knows you'll need it. You're not exactly the child-rearing type you know. Hmm. I thought they would kick your ass for thinking like that. Shikaku's too lazy to be troubled with thinking that way, and Choza's too is going. But it's appreciated. No problem. But I should probably get back. I don't want to think about what could happen if he got into my special stash. Horn. The glare sent in Noichi's way was enough to make the season down and flinch and lower his eyes. I keep my really fun toys at home. I don't trust the guys at work not to fuck them up, and I don't trust Anko not to overuse them. Inoichi shuddered. Um, yeah, getting home would probably be a good idea. The Biki kun Naruto kun have a seat, please, the Hokage greeted with a smile. I believe I have some information that may interest the both of you. What's that old man? Is it about my dad? You said you were going to look at it and see if there was anything that proved it, Naruto asked eagerly. I'm not completely sure. The Yandane was a private individual, at least when it came to his own life. Very sociable, but very secretive as well. He had the ability to turn any conversation away from himself without you knowing it until later when you realized you didn't get any information. This was a good thing, with his numerous enemies, but it does make finding information about him that I didn't already know difficult. It may have taken me a month, but I found one of his scrolls recently, and I believe it is the solution to our problem. How do you know that? Naruto asked. It has his seal on it. Oh. However, I don't know what it contains, simply for the fact that this seal acts not only as an identifying seal, but also as a blood seal. It appears too from around the time of the Kaiubi attack, but again, I cannot be sure. Okay. But if you don't know what's in it, how do you know you have information for us? Do you know what a blood seal does? I think so. Ibiki had one put on his box of toys so I can't get into them. He hasn't even let me see what's in it to know if I want to play with them or not. Mimi. Naruto stuck his tongue out at his guardian, who smiled back. Luckily, Naruto was mostly used to it by now. 
For those that weren't, one of Ibiki's smiles was a fairly frightening sight. Saratobi was trying to decide between disciplining Ibiki for keeping torture implements in his apartment and laughing at the fact that Naruto thought Ibiki had toys he was keeping from him. He settled on an impassive face that came from years of experience of suppressing reactions and continued on. Yes. A blood seal will only open for those people key to the seal and their family. This primarily used to protect clan secrets, however, I suppose it could be used to keep things from mischievous little ninjas. But I still don't see how that helps us know if the Yandame is my dad or not. Ibiki really hadn't thought Naruto was this dense. Sometimes he wasn't. Sometimes Naruto made incredible insights that people doing double take simply to confirm who made the comment. Other times, he was like this, denser than people believed possible. He means that if your blood works on the seal, you're related to the Yandame, regardless of the information inside. Oh. That makes sense. But, old man Hokage, why didn't you have this thing before? I thought everything Yandame left was a great treasure or something. Siratobi cleared his throat. Yes, well, do you remember what I said was the greatest bane of any Hokage? I know this Anu at was something stupid paperwork. That was it. Paperwork. Naruto sat back in his seat, looking distinctly pleased with himself. At the time after the attack, Kanoha was in a state of disrepair, and quite frankly, we were more concerned with the village. Paper got shuffled around, and records from the time are shaky at best. I think this scroll was simply mixed in with something else and got lost among the archives. That's why it took me so long. Not to mention the Kazama clan was known for being rather unorganized. Oh. Okay. But when I become Hokage, I'm going to do something about that paperwork you keep complaining about. I don't know what yet, but I'm gonna fix it. Tsuritobi chuckled. Naruto-kun, if you accomplish that and that alone, you would most certainly be the greatest Hokage. But back onto the topic at hand, all you need to do is smear a little blood over the seal. Alright. Naruto quickly bit his thumb, ran the blood over the scroll's seal. Nothing happened for a moment or two, save Naruto sucking the excess blood off his thumb, and then the seal glowed a faint blue before opening. Hey, it worked. We saw that kid. But I'd say that confirmed it. You're the Yandame's son. There isn't any way to fake that, is there? The Hokage drew a long breath from his pipe, blowing out slowing. No. Not that I know of, and especially none that Naruto would be able to perform. To fool a blood seal would require copious preparation, prior knowledge, and most likely a seal master, and Naruto-kun had none of those. Naruto-kun is the Kazama heir. Now, if you would be so kind, can you tell us what is on the scroll? Naruto shrugged and started reading over it. Um, I don't know what this is. May I see? Naruto tossed the confusing scroll to the Hokage. This is a storage scroll. But why would Arashi-kun put a blood seal on a basic storage scroll? Unseal, Saratobi commanded, and in a puff of smoke, there were three tri-pronged kunai in the center of the scroll. Ibiki's eyes widened, and the Sandame smiled. What's so special about those? They're just some funky kunai, right? No, not at all. These kunai were instrumental in a technique that gave the Yande most of his fame. These were the reason he was called the Yellow Flash of Kanoha. Whoa, cool, Naruto said, eyes now fixated on the weapons. Do you think I could learn that jutsu? Huh? Don't get too excited. I do not know the technique, nor do I have any scrolls that detail it. There may be something in the Kazama clan house, but other than that, the only other person who could even begin to help you would be my former student Jiraiya, and I'm not certain how much about it he knows. The only person to master that technique was Arashi-kun. Don't worry old man, I learn it, even if I have to teach it to myself. The old man chuckled. I wouldn't get ahead of yourself. Make sure that you know the basics beforehand. However, since it has been proven that you are part of the Kazama clan, there is one other topic we need to address. Living arrangements. It took Ibiki a moment to realize exactly what the Hokage was getting at, but that was probably just because he didn't want to believe it. Hokage-sama, you can't be serious. My apartment is fine for the two of us, and that place is. That place is a part of Naruto-kun's inheritance. I agree that your apartment is fine for now, but Naruto-kun is a growing boy and needs a place to develop. Your apartment is not the best place for that. Not to mention, there will be more places to hide your toys. What place are you two talking about? It's like you're trying to keep me out of the conversation or something, Naruto grumbled. No, we weren't trying to keep you out of the conversation. I was merely trying to convince Ibiki to let you move into the Kazama clan house. It is your inheritance and probably more suitable for raising someone as rambunctious as you than a small apartment. Wait. I have a house. Naruto questioned in disbelief. The Hokage nodded. Yada. I've got a house. Sorry Ibiki, but if you don't want to live there, I'm going on my own. I've got a house. Kid, I'm not letting you live on your own. Then you're living with me at my house. Haha. Ha, ha. But it's a piece of Kanoha history. You can't just live there. It would be disrespectful. But it's mine, and I want to live there. Why can't I? 
Saratobi interrupted before the argument could go too far. I'm sorry Ibiki-kun, but Naruto-kun is right. It is his house, and he has every right to live there if he wishes. I would hope that you would go with him, if only to make sure he doesn't end up hurting himself, but you can't do anything to stop him. Ibiki grumbled. Fine. I live in the house, but I'm doing so under protest. Alright. When can we move in? The elderly Hokage merely chuckled at Naruto's wide-eyed expression. The Kazama clan house was far different from the other clan houses. For one thing, it wasn't in the noble district. The Ichihas and the Hyugas had always looked down on them for this, but since Naruto was the only Kazama left and they looked down on him anyway, he didn't care. Instead of the noble district, the house was in middle of the woods, closer to some of the training grounds than anything else. The dense woods surrounding it made it hard to find unless you knew exactly where you were going. The dense woods also had Naruto's mind racing with the sheer number of pranks he could set up in defense of his home. Another noticeable difference between Naruto's new abode and the other clan houses was the way it was set up. Whereas the Ichihas had a small city sprawling to house their clan, and the Hyugas favored a complex of rigid buildings, unyielding to any change, the Kazama clan house was small. Granted, it was still a large building, enough so for 15 people to live comfortably without doubling up, but it had nothing on the other clan houses of Konoha. The area where the Kazama clan house excelled was the grounds. The Ichihas kept building until they had a small city with no vegetation, and the Hyugas held immaculate grounds and gardens, where you simply couldn't do anything for fear of disturbing something. However, the grounds where our hero now stood were perfect, at least in his mind. You could walk through them and be at one with the woods, you could hop through the branches in a never-ending game of nothing, or you could train to the point of exhaustion, whatever your desire. But the one thing that put all other reasons to love the house to shame was simple in Naruto's mind. It was his. Being an orphan who held the hatred of the village, save a few, Naruto had very little things he could call his own. What he was able to call his own, he held in high regard. Most of the things he owned, he couldn't really call his own his old apartment. Paid for by the Hokage. Most of his clothes. Same thing. But now he had something of his own, something that had been his family's, and no one was going to be able to take that away from him. He wouldn't let them. As Naruto stepped into his house, he felt something he had never felt before. He felt at home. He had lived places before, but never felt like he could really relax and call it home. His apartment was barely fit to live in, and while Ibiki's place was a lot better, it wasn't home. So kid, what do you think? Ibiki asked. Naruto was speechless for once in his life, something that anyone who knew him would pay to see. It's incredible. Chapter 2. Naruto soaked in his onsen, relaxing and thinking about how his life had changed over the years. It was certainly for the better, that was for sure. He had befriended the Nara and Akamichi children and could be around Ino whenever she wasn't obsessing about Sasuke. Well that wasn't a lot of the time, it was definitely more time than if he were trying to talk to Sakura. Not that he tried that often. Naruto had asked Sakura out once, and after a particularly violent refusal, Naruto stopped asking. He had enough people that wanted to hit him, he wasn't about to add another one. But Sakura couldn't seem to see that. After Naruto stopped asking, they seemed to get paired up a lot. Sakura thought Naruto was trying to get paired up with her on purpose and ended up hitting him all the time. Needless to say, Naruto wasn't happy. Naruto had even become friends with the Aburamare, strange as it may have seemed to others. This wasn't to say that their friendship was entirely normal. It started during lunch one day at the academy. Shikamaru and Chaoji were out with the flu, and Naruto didn't want to eat alone. He saw Shino sitting alone and plopped down next to the Aburam. After a while of Naruto talking and Shino sitting silent, Iruka called them back in, and Naruto thanked Shino for sitting with him and letting his talk. Shino nodded, and from that day forth, they were sitting together. Naruto talked incessantly, and Shino rarely said a word. Shikamaru and Chaoji couldn't really explain it, but the two opposites were close. In truth, Naruto was able to read Shino's moods better than anyone else at the academy after a while, and Shino was able to read Naruto's actual moods, rather than the false front he so often put up, something even Ibiki had trouble with at times. After a year or so, Shino finally asked the question that had been plaguing him for some time. He wanted to know why his Kikai bugs didn't like getting near Naruto. After some pestering, read, Shino looking at Naruto in silence and Naruto knowing that Shino really wanted to know, but wouldn't hold it against him if he never told him, just because he's a good friend, Naruto caved. Shino sat in silence for a moment while Naruto started apologizing and stammering that he understood if Shino never wanted to see him again. Shino stopped him with a simple thank you and let Naruto know that he understood, using the Kikai as his example. Just because there were Kikai in his body, that didn't mean he was a Kikai. After that, Shino didn't mention it anymore and didn't act any different. Naruto was a better friend for it. Naruto didn't get to see Tenten too often, but he made sure to stop by her family's weapon shop at least every other week. 
she kept on him to take up more weapons, but he knew he would never take up more than one or two, maybe three, outside of normal kunai and shuriken. She claimed that if he had more weapons, he'd always be prepared, no matter the situation. He claimed that if he had just a few and trained against all of hers, he wouldn't need all of the weapons she carried. It was really just an argument carried on between friends for the sake of it. Both knew what they were going to do, and the other wasn't going to be convinced their way was wrong. Benton was going to work with an absurd amount of weapons, and Naruto was going to do whatever the hell he needed to, damn the odds, and damn what he's supposed to be able to actually pull off. Hiba and Naruto had a friendly rivalry with each other, or at least as friendly as things would ever get between them. They both respected the other's abilities, and if hard-pressed to give an honest answer, they'd say the other was a damn good ninja. By other than that, the two were completely content to glare at each other, insult each other, argue, and occasionally pull a prank together, hey, pranks take precedence over any argument. Sasuke and Naruto had a not-so-friendly rivalry. It was easy to say that they despised each other. Sasuke was top in the class and made sure everyone knew it. Breeding, stuck up, had most everything handed to him on a sliver platter, couldn't get over his past, had almost every girl in the village hounding after him for it, and Naruto hated him for it. Sasuke just didn't like anyone. Naruto could sympathize with having a bad past. Naruto could deal with Sasuke's revenge kick, to a point. Sasuke being the top of the class wasn't such a big deal, he was talented. Stuck up, he was in a chair, it was expected. Sasuke's fan club was a problem, but personally, Naruto thought a lot of them were scary, and at this point, was wondering if Sasuke was gay, the evidence was there, just look at his hair. The biggest problem was all of it combined, how he couldn't get over his past, or at least come to terms with it, how the teachers made sure the Achiha got the most help, even though he rarely needed it, and how he disregarded everyone who wanted to help him. It was something Naruto couldn't understand, and so rivals they were. After a good long while of arguing, insults, and psychological warfare, Kaiubi and Naruto were finally able to come to an understanding. Naruto would do his damnedest not to die or get too injured, and Kaiubi would help him by giving him chakra, helping with stamina, and sometimes giving him a little bit of knowledge from the Kaiubi's vast years. They still bickered like a married couple most of the time though. Ibiki had been a good influence on Naruto. He was a good male role model, one that was there every day, unlike the Hokage. Ibiki helped with Naruto's training and studies, but with the academy teachers sabotaging Naruto's work, it was hard. Ibiki would have done something, but the academy teachers were sneaky enough to not get caught by Naruto, and without proof, Naruto wouldn't say anything that could get him into trouble like that, no it would end up worse for him in the long run. When Naruto once claimed that he wanted to be just like his adopted older brother, Ibiki adamantly refused to teach Naruto the art of interrogation as he knew it. Naruto argued, and eventually, they came to an agreement. Ibiki wouldn't teach Naruto the physical aspect, he did end up educating the Jinchuriki on human psychology. Ibiki claimed this was more effective than physical torture when used properly. However, Naruto was still one of the most coolest people in all the shinobi villages when it came to the opposite sex. Ibiki also proved to be a horrible cook, only being able to do breakfast reasonably well, and that was still taking chances, so Naruto learned to cook fairly well. Naruto eventually figured out exactly what Ibiki meant by his toys, but still pestered the scarred man about it because he knew it annoyed him. Another person Naruto had gotten close to was Midarashi Anko. They had argued at first when they had met at the Hokage Tower. Several arguments and physical altercations later, they came to a topic they could agree on, Orochimaru. Anko wanted to kill him for abandoning her, and when Ibiki okayed it, Naruto told her his reasons for wanting to kill the snake bastard. As Naruto's story went on, Anko found she hated her old sensei more. It was one thing to bring pain to an individual, but he was the reason for the Kaiubi attack, and that was something that was truly beyond the pale. They kept talking and grew closer. After she was kicked out of her apartment for assaulting the manager, Naruto convinced her to come live with him. She agreed, just until she found her own place again. When she realized Naruto wasn't going to kick her out, she stopped looking for a new apartment. Now they were more like a dysfunctional brother and sister than anything else. The academy was not the best place for Naruto. The part that made sure Naruto always went, other than Ibiki threatening him, was that he could see his friends. Excluding the Minaruka, there weren't many people who wanted him at the academy. The teachers covertly switched tests on him, berated him for things that would have garnered praise from a decent teacher, and actively made fun of him. Granted, it was difficult to keep his interest for some of the more academic pursuits, but if anyone really bothered to look, they would see him as the exceptional shinobi he was becoming. Already he was able to evade all the Chunin squad sent after him, and most of the Anbu squads. If Naruto were anyone else, he would have been lauded as the next great shinobi of the village, counted among those like the Professor, the Sanin, and the Yellow Flash. Instead, they tried everything they could to make sure he would die on his first mission out. After speaking with Shikamaru, they decided to do something about it. 
Shikamaru didn't know why everyone seemed to hate Naruto, but if they wanted to make sure he failed, why not oblige them? Naruto was against the idea at first, but eventually agreed. The two would stay at the bottom of the class as best as possible and still keep passing grades. Shikamaru was lazy and just didn't want to do the work, and the teachers left Naruto alone more when he was doing poorly than when he was doing his best, so the plan was put into motion. Naruto had trouble going along with it at first, but when Shikamaru pointed out that if people were thinking they were fighting the dead last, they wouldn't expect to be fighting someone much better than that. Naruto's protest stopped soon after that. Naruto's full strength was something that Shikamaru didn't know. Naruto had broken into the Kazama clan jutsu vault and started reading. After a few chakra control scrolls, which had Naruto cursing profusely before he mastered them, he came across a scroll for Cage Bunch and No Jutsu. While also on the Forbidden Scroll of the Village, it was originally created by a Kazama. Unfortunately for Naruto, a lot of scrolls were locked up with seals that would prevent him from accessing him until he was able to gain a better understanding of seals than he had or was able to prove he was the proper rank in the village. He was just happy the Kazama weren't known for the organizational skills and Cage Bunshin and a few other upper rank techniques were misfiled. Naruto hadn't really changed much over the years. He had gotten stronger, a little more mature, had become accepted by a few of the clans in the village, but he was still Naruto at heart. He played pranks as often as possible, ate as much ramen as he could, and with Ibiki's cooking, they spent quite a few meals at Ichiraku's, called the Hokage Old Man, was the shortest person in his academy class, and rather sensitive about it too, and proclaimed he would become Hokage. He still wore his orange jumpsuit, no matter how often Ibiki tried to get it away from him, thought he had a weight suit underneath it and a trench coat reminiscent of Ibiki's now. All in all, life had been pretty good to Naruto over the years. Little did he know that the most life-changing moment was yet to come. Naruto snapped his eyes open, sitting in the middle of a training field, just after dusk. He had been meditating to talk to Kai Ubi. The demon lord had decided that Naruto had earned another lesson, and so Naruto was out in one of the remote training areas where no one would bother him while he was in his mind. But when Naruto opened his eyes, there was someone there. There was a woman with long blue hair and a black cloak with red clouds standing in front of him. Hello, Naruto-kun. You need to come with me. My organization needs you. Naruto snorted. Yeah right. I'm not going with you, I don't even know you. Go away, I need to train. The woman with blue hair shook her head. I'm afraid you don't understand. It wasn't a request. You will come with me right now. No. I don't want to. Now leave me alone. The blue-haired nin stood still for a moment before launching herself straight for Naruto. Before the blonde could react, the nin's fingers were glowing and slammed directly over the seal on his stomach. Pain. That's the only word to describe it. Pure, unadulterated pain. Naruto felt as if his skeleton shattered all at once as his skin melted off. It only lasted for a second, but the agony felt like days. Darkness. Rat. Get up and listen to me. Whatever that bastard just did screwed us up. The seal's weakening, and we need to do something to stop it. What are you talking about? If you don't listen to me and do exactly as I say, we're both going to die. And the resulting chakra explosion's going to take out your whole damn village. We need to move. You're going to wake up in a minute or two, and you need to write a note to that old man leading your village, so we don't have people chasing after us. Whatever that bitch did to us sent out a massive chakra wave, and once people stop being scared out of their wits, they'll be investigating what's going on. What I have planned can't have people around us. We're just lucky whatever that girl did to us backfired and killed her, so we don't have to worry about that. And to ease your fears, I'm not asking you to release me. Now wake up and move. Saratobi landed in the clearing, clad in his full battle gear, flanked by three Anbu squads. In the center of the clearing, there lay a smoking body and a scroll. The wave of chakra had disappeared as quickly as it came, and Saratobi wanted to know what the hell happened. Saratobi advanced first, making sure the body was exactly that, a body, and not a trap. That confirmed, he turned his attention to the scroll. It looked hastily rolled and was marked with Hey Old Man in Naruto's even hastier scroll. Chuckling, Saratobi checked it for all the traps he could and finding none, opened it. Old man, I took this scroll off the dead guy and I don't have a lot of time, cause if I don't leave soon, I'm gonna die. The blue-haired bastard messed up something with the seal and Kaiubi says that he has a plan to fix it. It's not to release him, cause that would kill us both or something. But if I don't leave, we'll both die and we might end up destroying the whole village. So, I'm going somewhere else to do what needs to be done to protect everyone and you shouldn't send anyone after me. And you can't send any hunter nin after me, since I'm not a ninja yet. Ha. I'll be back for my genin exam. Bye. Naruto, P.S. If it helps, the girl said her organization needed me for something. Okajama, what are our orders? Suratobi sighed. Collect any evidence you can that tells us what happened here. Bring the body back to the tower, we'll have our experts look at it. 
yes, Hokage-sama. Saratobi steeled himself as he called in the two people he knew would take the previous night's events the hardest. Ibiki and Anko walked in, their faces flickering between irritation, anger, and worry. Is this about my Ataudo? He didn't come back last night from where he was training. If those damn villagers did anything to him, I'll kill them, Anko ranted. No, I won't kill them. I'll take them and put them in the forest of death for a few weeks, and then I'll kill them. Maybe I'll, Saratobi held up a hand. Anko-chan, this does have to do with Naruto-kun, but as far as I know, the villagers had nothing to do with it. Last night, Naruto-kun was attacked by an unknown nin. Apparently, this person did something that corrupted the fourth seal. This resulted in the chakra wave that we all felt last night. Naruto-kun left so he could attempt to fix the seal. He left a scroll explaining what was happening. Before Saratobi could continue, and before Anko could get any angrier, they felt a chakra explosion from the north. Unlike a normal chakra explosion that exploded and faded away, this one kept building in strength. It was easily recognized as the Kaiubi's chakra, everyone who was alive for the attack remembered it well. It grew to the point where even the most experienced and hardened of shinobi were staggering and shaking under its weight. And as it came to the point where people thought they were going to die from the sheer force, it disappeared. It didn't fade from existence, it simply wasn't there anymore. Anbu were in the Hokage's office immediately, waiting for orders. Anko knew better than to interrupt, Saratobi was in his command mode. I will be going with you to investigate what just happened. Three units will be going with me, as well as Anko and Ibiki. We leave in 15 minutes. Go. Saratobi, Anko, and Ibiki weren't at all reassured when all they found at the epicenter of the chakra explosion was scorched earth and a few tracks leading away before disappearing completely. Saratobi walked into his office early in the morning, as was his custom. As he entered, he stopped short, and a kunai found its way to his hand and for good reason. There was a rather large fox with a bag around its neck sitting on his desk. Please do not attack me, Hokage-sama, the fox requested in a pleasant tone. I bring word from Naruto-sama. The fox then poked his nose around the bag that was thrown over his neck. A moment later, he pulled out a scroll and placed it on the desk. Naruto-sama wishes for you to know that he plans to ride in another month or so. The fox bowed his head and disappeared in a puff of smoke. Hey old man, I know you're probably pretty angry with me for taking off like I did, but it needed to be done, and it's worked out in the end. I'm fine for now, and I'm training my butt off to make sure I pass the genin exam in a couple of months. I'm not going to tell you what happened a month and a half ago, because you probably won't believe me, and if this gets intercepted, and I don't think it will, I don't want to tread by the wrong person. Just know that I'm fine and will be back in a few months. I just need to make sure I have a few things under control before I come back, because I don't want anybody freaking out. And you should probably tell Tenten, Shikamaru, and Chaoji about my fuzzy little secret. I don't know how well I'll be able to hide it from them, and they deserve to know anyway. You should probably let Ino know too. She may be loud and obnoxious, but she is there for you when you need it. Just make sure she knows how important it is for her not to tell anyone, because otherwise it'll be all over the village. Not like most of the villagers don't know anyway and get Shino to help you tell them. He found out a while ago, and it'll probably be good for them to hear someone their age knows and doesn't care. Tell Anko Nichan and Ibiki and Nikki that I'm doing good and that they shouldn't worry. I know they are, but they don't have to, so they shouldn't. Make sure you don't run my village into the ground while I'm gone. Naruto, the future Hokage and greatest shinobi ever. Saratobi read the scroll several times before setting it down on his desk, leaning back in his chair, taking a long draw on his pipe, and sighing deeply. Naruto-kun, what are we ever going to do with you? You make my day when I hear from you and make it so much harder at the same time. Saratobi thought the meeting with Naruto's friends went better than expected. Shikamaru had already had suspicions and Chaoji didn't much care. Naruto was Naruto in his book. Unless something happened to change that, he wasn't about to stop hanging out with him. Denton thought about it for a while, and while she wasn't completely okay with the thought, especially since someone she trusted had kept something like that from her for so long, she wasn't going to discriminate against him. Naruto hadn't done anything to misplace her trust, other than run off and not tell her about the Kaiubi, but she could beat him up for that later. Ino was the worst though. She freaked out when she heard, and it took nearly five minutes to get her calmed down. Shino was a big help, as Naruto predicted. He picked up a glass of water and asked Ino if the glass was water or just the container. After getting over the initial shock of hearing Shino actually speak more than three words and a little more reasoning, Ino was fairly well convinced that Naruto wasn't about to go on a rampage through the village. However, after this, he told them all some of what Naruto had had to endure over the years and they were less than happy about the stories they heard. 
Ino and Tenten were by far the most outraged, Chaoji was wearing an expression they had only seen when someone insulted his weight, and even Shikamaru had abandoned his lazy expression for one of annoyance and determination, he would have been outraged as well, but that would have been too troublesome. Shino once again proved his worth for being there by telling them all that it would do no good to get upset. The villagers weren't going to change their minds just because a bunch of children, this earned death glares from both Kanoichi, but Shino didn't seem to notice, got upset with them. It would be better if they did their best to make sure Naruto was seen in the best light possible and to help him achieve his dream. When Ino scoffed at Naruto becoming Hokage, Shino fixed her with a glare. He said that Naruto had the sheer determination necessary to become the leader of the village and obviously loved the village, proved by the fact that he hadn't gone nuts and tried to kill everyone yet. If there was anyone worth being Hokage, Naruto was it. Everyone had their own reasons for becoming ninjas, but Naruto's was the one that a Hokage needed to protect those that couldn't protect themselves. After hearing Shino talk so much, everyone calmed down, vowed to help Naruto, and silently promised slow and lingering deaths to those who spoke ill of Naruto in their presence. Anko and Ibiki didn't take the news that Naruto was staying away from the village for several more months too well. Saratobi felt sorry for the people they were interrogating. Another month and a half later, Saratobi found himself in a similar situation, kunai in hand and fox on desk. Are you going to threaten me with a kunai every time I deliver a message, Hokage-sama? The fox asked in the same pleasant and respectful tone and giving Saratobi the impression that the fox was grinning just like Naruto. I once more bring you news from Naruto-sama. After rummaging around in his bag for a moment, the messenger fox placed a scroll on the desk, gave a respectful bow of its head, and disappeared in a poof of smoke. Saratobi sighed and made his way over to his desk, wondering what kind of headache Naruto was going to give him this time. He loved the blonde, but he really could be trouble sometimes. Hey old man, figured I'd write and tell you what I've been up to out here. Training has been taking up most of my time, and I keep moving around, seeing if I can help out with things to earn some money, so I don't end up going hungry. I've gotten really good at some of the stuff. Some of the places have even enlisted my help with breaking up bandit camps. And I've just met up with these two really strong nins who I've convinced to train me for a while. I'm still going to be back to Kanoha for the Genin exam, but I'm not going to pass up this chance to learn a bunch of new jutsu. I'm having a lot of fun, so you really don't need to worry. Tell everyone who still wants to be around me that I miss them and I'll be back in a couple months. Naruto, future Hokage. Saratobi sent for Naruto's friends and family, upset that Naruto had such little faith in his friends that he believed they would abandon him, glad that Naruto hadn't given him anything to worry about in this message, and only slightly concerned about the two nins Naruto mentioned training him. After all, Saratobi trusted Naruto's judgment, and if Naruto trusted them, he would have to as well. It wasn't as if he had any hints on the Naruto's location. Two months later, and Saratobi was actually able to control himself from bringing a kunai to his hand when he saw the messenger fox sitting on his desk. Once again, the fox gave him a scroll and left before Saratobi had a chance to ask the fox how it managed to get inside the tower. Hey old man, I've had to split up with the people I was training with, so I'll be heading back to Kanoha now. I'm a lot stronger and you won't believe some of the stuff I've learned. Anyway, I should be back in the village in three weeks or so, and that leaves plenty of time before my exam, in case I get held up with something. See you then, and Kami help you if you've messed up anything in my village for when I take over. Naruto, future Hokage. I don't know what he's talking about with plenty of time, he's only allowing a week grace period. It will be good to have the blonde bundle of energy back in the village again though. A month later, and Suratobi was wondering where Naruto was. He said three weeks and had claimed he would be back in time for the exam, but it was the day the academy class opposed to test and so far there had been no sign of Naruto. Saratobi exited his house and sweat dropped. Naruto was back. The Hokage monument was painted fairly well with various designs, swirls, and mocking signs. The Shadai and Nidame's faces were the most lurid faces covered in the most designs. The paint job done to his face made him look a lot younger, and it also made him look like pervert, with dual nose bleeds and proclamations of Iro Jiji and Hentai. The Yandame's face was actually fairly respectful, though the overall paint job made it look like the fourth was a woman. Seeing the sight after six months of no Yuzumaki style pranks, Saratobi laughed out loud. I just wonder if he can still outrun the Anbu patrols like he used to be able to, the Hokage muttered as he started off towards his office. Saratobi walked up to his office and was greeted by a sight he honestly hadn't expected. Naruto was standing there without any Anbu patrols guarding him, meaning he hadn't been caught by them, but was instead flanked by a silver fox, a pig wearing a red vest and pearl necklace, Tsunade, and Shizune. Well, Naruto-kun, you do know how to announce your return. It's good to see you haven't lost your touch. Tsunade, Shizune-chan, welcome back to Konoha. Why don't we go inside to catch up? 
Saratobi didn't wait for their responses, just walked into his office, knowing they would follow. As they sat down, Saratobi pulled six seal covered slips of paper, channeled chakra into them, and one flew to each of the walls, the ceiling, and the floor. Okay, now we can talk about what exactly happened over the past few months without any chance of being overheard. I'm expecting an interesting story, Naruto-kun, after all, no normal circumstance could get my most attractive student to return. Tsunade scowled, but Naruto started talking before the slug Sanin could say anything. Well, it started when that guy in the stupid looking cloak messed up the seal. I still don't know what he wanted, but Fuzzy thinks it has something to do with him. Anyway, I had to do a ritual with Fuzzy that would keep us from dying, and it's a good thing that I got so far away from Konoha before I did it, cause it took out everything for a kilometer around. Tsuritobi nodded. Yes, I know. A team headed by myself was dispatched to see just what caused the explosion of chakra that we felt here. Would you mind telling me just what the effects of this ritual were? Well, you may not like it, but I promise I have everything under control. Remember that I have everything under control. Naruto took a deep breath and continued. The seal had been weakened where it wouldn't hold fuzzy, and if it broke, we'd both die. So what we had to do was get close enough together for the seal to bind fuzzy properly again. What that means is that we're basically bonded together now. We're separate, but the same at the same time, if that makes any sense. And there's no real way to separate us. Even some of the methods Kaiubi thought of that would allow him to live and just kill me wouldn't work. They'd end up killing us both. Who am I talking to right now, Naruto or Kaiubi? Asked Saratobi, covertly gripping a kunai under the desk. Naruto frowned. Now that's just rude old man, it's Naruto. Fuzzy doesn't get any time outside unless I summon him. And even if Fuzzy were here, he wouldn't be trying to destroy Kanoha like you think. He says that only humans keep grudges for that long. Demons get mad, fight, and get over it. Humans are a lot more foolish. You say that as if you aren't human anymore, Saratobi said tightly. Well it was another one of the things that happened because of the ritual. Don't freak out. Please. Bachan did, and she hits really hard. As if a demonstration, Tsunade smacked Naruto in the back of the head. I've told you not to call me that, brat. As Naruto picked himself up off the floor, he sent a glare at Tsunade, but contained himself and didn't yell at her like he wanted. Instead, he placed his hands in a seal and pleaded with Saratobi once more, don't freak out. Release. As the large puff of smoke cleared, Saratobi's grip on his kunai tightened, but he didn't throw it just because he trusted Naruto, and if Tsunade had seen it and wasn't trying to keep Naruto from doing it, things couldn't be too bad. Where Naruto had been standing, there now stood a person that was Naruto's hide and build and held many similarities to Naruto, but wasn't quite Naruto. The new Naruto had Naruto's blonde hair, but there were also several silver streaks running through the hair. Two silver fox ears twitched atop Naruto's head, the very tips of familiar blonde color. Blue eyes veined with silver held slit pupils, and familiar whisker marks were much longer and deeper, reaching the very edges of Naruto's face. Elongated canines poked at his lips, and claws were the only way to describe Naruto's fingers. But the biggest surprise was what was behind him. Three swaying flowing tails, silver and tipped with orange tinted blonde, grew from the base of Naruto's back. Naruto held up two clawed hands in a defensive gesture. Hold on there, it's still me. Actually, it's more me than before. This is what I really look like now. I was using a demonic illusion, one you can only see through if you have some demonic chakra going through your coils. Of course keeping it up all the time is kind of tiring, but when I take it down, I'm a lot stronger cause I'm not suppressing the yaki or my hanyu chakra anymore. When the ritual bonded fuzzy in me, it flooded my chakra system with demon chakra. Because the seal had already adapted my body to accepting and using yaki, I didn't die. Instead, I became this, a hanyu, a half-demon fox. And like I said, I'm a lot stronger in this form because I don't have to worry about keeping up the illusion all the time. But don't worry, I'm in complete control. Like I said, Fuzzy doesn't have any time outside unless I summon him. And how would you summon him? Well, I suppose like any other summon. I am the holder of the Kitsune contract after all, and Fuzzy is the boss Kitsune. Of course, since Fuzzy is also a demon lord and not just a summon boss, he keeps some of his old tricks. And part of the deal I have with him is that I let him out to have a night on the town every once in a while. Saratobi couldn't control his confusion as it blossomed on his face. Just how can a gigantic nine-tailed fox demon have a night on the town? Wouldn't people run screaming? Naruto rolled his eyes. Well yeah, but he doesn't go to town as a giant fox. I told you he kept some of his old tricks and being able to change his size and assume human shape is just two of them. Really old man, you need to think sometimes. Tsunade laughed, but Shizun looked upset that Naruto would speak to the leader of the village in such a way. You know, even if the brat didn't get me to come back, I would have come back just to see him talk to you like that. Priceless. Saratobi looked annoyed, but directed the conversation where he wanted. 
And just how did Naruto convince you to come back? Tsunade's face darkened and a scowl blossomed as she muttered something about lucky brats and tricking people Naruto just laughed. Okay, I'll tell it because you'll just make me sound mean if you do botchan. After picking himself up from the floor again, Naruto continued. Well, you see, I'd been training for a couple months and I was ready to come back here when Fuzzy suggested we take a detour to one of his old dens that was nearby. It wasn't going to take me too far out of the way and there was a bunch of stuff in there that was really cool, I'm going to have to go back for some more of it soon. I could only get so much. But anyway, once I was coming back from there, I stopped in this town. I had enough for a hotel and I was really glad cause I was getting tired of sleeping in the woods every night. But anyway, Gintoku here, Naruto rubbed the silver fox's head fondly, got away from me. He ran me all over town before I finally caught up with him, flashback, hey, get out of here you stupid fox. Leave Taunton alone. Naruto stumbled around a corner and saw the situation his companion had gotten himself in. Hey, leave Gintoku alone. Naruto dutifully marched towards his fox friend and snatched him away from the black-haired woman before placing him on the ground and glaring. What did you think you were doing? Huh? It's one thing in the woods, but in town you know you aren't supposed to run off. People aren't near as forgiving as you think. The fox yipped and whined for a minute before Naruto interrupted. I don't care if you were just having a little fun, it's dangerous. I don't want anything to happen to you, and it will if you run off. Especially if we were in Kanoha. People there don't like foxes, and if you were to go running around there, there's no telling what would happen. Another moment of yips and whines. I agree the pig smells good, but that doesn't mean you can try to make it dinner. Taunton looked alarmed and squealed. The pig is obviously someone's pet. How would you like it if someone tried to eat you, huh? You wouldn't like it would you? And besides, you had a rabbit not two hours ago. I spoil you rotten, I swear I do. Naruto turned to face the two women that were watching his strange conversation. I'm sorry about that. He got away from me. I would have caught him sooner if I hadn't just upped my weights. But that doesn't excuse him from trying to get at your pig. He knows better than that. Doesn't he? Naruto added with a glare and Gintoku placed his head between his paws and looked properly shameful. Present. Anyway, after that, we introduced ourselves and I asked if Bachan could train me. She blew me off. I got mad and challenged her to a fight. Tsuritobi shook his head. Naruto-kun, you really do get yourself into some bad situations, don't you? Naruto looked insulted. Whoever said that it was a bad situation? Bachan had already had a bunch to drink and said she could beat me with one finger. So we made a bet. If I could get her to use more than one finger, she would have to teach me something. Flashback, Tsunade and Naruto stood on either end of a street, Shizun looking on, worried. Tsunade taunted Naruto, and Naruto charged her. Not his smartest idea ever. Tsunade parried his punches with one finger and flicked him in forehead, sending careening down the street, smashing into a wall. Tsunade brushed her hands off and gave a self-satisfied smirk to Shizun. Then Naruto crawled out of the dust and loose stones, cursing. Looks like I'm going to have to take this serious. Count yourself lucky, Bachan. Tsunade growled at the new nickname as Naruto charged again. Just as she was about to flick him into oblivion, he puffed into smoke, leaving a rock with an explosive note in his place. The medden in her hands up to cover her face just in time. As Tsunade was recovering from the explosion, Naruto shot in with a punch and landed it right in the gut. As a reflex, Tsunade batted her opponent away with a smack. As Naruto rose from his position against the wall this time, he was laughing and holding the new lump on his head as he stemmed the flow of blood from his lip. Haha, I win. What are you talking about, win? You're going to be dead by the time I get done with you, brat. Tsunade ranted, sobering up, wanting to hurt the other blonde. I win, Bachan. You said you would only use one finger to beat me, and you just hit me with your whole hand. You would have demolished me if we were really fighting, but you're a Sanin, and I'm not even a Genin yet. If you couldn't beat me, there's something wrong. But I just had to get you to use more than one finger, and I did, so now you have to teach me something. As he finished, he started to do a little victory dance, and everyone's sweat dropped. Present. And just what did you teach him, Tsunade? He's got some pretty good chakra control, but he doesn't have the control necessary for medical jutsu, and he never will, what with the violent nature of the Yaki. Not to mention Yaki simply won't convert into medical chakra, even if he did have the control necessary. So instead, I taught him my most famous original tojutsu move. Tsuritobi looked horrified. You didn't. You mean you taught him. Tsunade's smirk grew till it threatened to take over her face. Yes. I taught him the thousand years of pain. And I was impressed. He used a kunai and explosive tag, last time I saw him practicing it. Hey. Don't go giving away all my secrets. I need to beat this guy to take his job someday. Well, that makes some sense, but it still doesn't explain exactly why you came back, Tsunade. Not that I'm complaining, of course. It's always good to see you. 
Burrito chuckled. Yeah, she doesn't like this part of the story. In order to save face, she made me another bet, and I won that one too. That led to another series of bets that led to me winning her grandfather's necklace, training until I become a Chuanin, and her coming back here to rearrange the hospital. Though she kinda wanted to do that herself when I told her about how they treated me. Started grumbling about how medics are supposed to keep personal bias out of things. And just what were these bets? Asked Siratobi, genuinely curious. Tsunade glared. Don't ask. I'm not going to tell you. And neither will the brat if he knows what's good for him. But know that I'm going over to the hospital when I'm done here, and if what I see isn't up to my standards, you may be out a few doctors. Siratobi gulped. He didn't want to get in the way of Tsunade on a rampage. He wasn't that foolhardy. Very well. Naruto-kun, I'd like more information on your travels later on, but for now, I believe you have a genin exam to go take. The blonde nodded, set up his illusion again, collected Gintoku, and ran from the office. Tsuritobi made sure the privacy seals were still working before asking his next question. So, what was the real reason you came back? Tsunade sighed. Truthfully, Sensei, he gave me my soul back. He helped me get over Dan and the Waki's deaths, or at least work past it. He's apparently broken the curse on that necklace of mine, and he's gotten me to have a little respect for the Hokage title again. Not much, but more than there was before. And if what I heard about your hospital and Naruto's stories was true, we will be having problems. I don't care what your personal problems are, you don't let it come between you and healing someone, especially someone as innocent as him. Tsunade sighed. I was planning on leaving, even on the way back here. But we were ambushed by a bunch of bandits. Nothing we couldn't handle, but there were a lot of them all the same. We had taken down almost all of them, and Naruto saw one of the ones we thought was down sneaking up on Shizune. Naruto shot across the fight and stuck a kunai right in the guy's throat. I think it was the first time he really had to kill someone. He mentioned the woman who messed up his seal to me, but that was an accident and he didn't really see it happen. Add to the fact that he had bigger problems at the moment, I don't think it ever really connected. But this guy, he was right there and he killed to protect someone, but he still stuck a kunai in the man's carotid artery. You can't get much more personal than that. The rest of the bandits went down easy, but Naruto just stood there, shocked still, slowly being covered in the bandits' blood. But I pushed past that, Tsunade explained, seeing her sensei about to ask a question, and comforted the little brat. It was then I knew I couldn't abandon him to these damn villagers. Tsuritobi nodded understandingly. Naruto does have that effect on people. He cracked both Ibiki-kun and Anko-chan. They're all practically family now. Well he better have an extra room in that house of his he was bragging about. I remember it from when Arashi had us over, and I'm not abandoning him. Shizune just smiled warmly, glad that her mentor was home once more. Naruto tore through the village, pushing Chakra into his legs, appearing to be nothing more than a blur except a Jounin and other exceptional shinobi. Even so, he was barely in his seat before the bell rang. But as no one seemed to notice him yet, he cloaked his presence further and waited as Aruka called roll. After roll was finished and Naruto's name wasn't called, he yelled out, Hey Aruka-sensei, what about me? Every set of eyes swiveled to his seat in the back of the classroom, confusion, irritation, happiness, and relief flashing over their faces. Naruto, where have you been? What are you doing here? Are you responsible for what happened to the Hokage Monument this morning? Iruka demanded of his favorite student. Well, I have been on a training trip for the past six months, and I'm here to take my genin exam. Hokage's orders. And as for the monument, I'm shocked that you would think so little of me, shocked I tell you, Naruto said with a foxy grin, and a look in his eyes that screams so innocent I'm guilty, and shouldn't you be passing out the test right now? I mean, we don't have all day to spend here. I haven't had Ichirakus in six months, I'm in withdrawal. Iruka looked confused for a moment, but then sent a face to Naruto that stated we're going to talk later, and began passing out the tests. As Aruka was the one passing out the test and no one else knew Naruto was going to be back for the exam, Naruto got a fair test, one that he took with ease, answering every question correctly and with his own distinct flair, mostly sarcastic remarks and comments that Aruka would have yelled at him for if he had said them out loud. After the written exam, Mizuki took them outside for the tojutsu portion of the exam. Most used the academy tojutsu, the ones from clans using their family style, earning them points in their own way, but seeing as Naruto wasn't on the list as normal, he went last. The test required them to land a blow on Mizuki or fight well enough to prove they deserved a pass. Mizuki had been waiting for this portion because he could beat on the demon brat without anyone being able to complain about it. However, it was not meant to be. As soon as Mizuki motioned for Naruto to start, the blonde shot forward with a punch to the gut that caught his sensei completely off guard and knocked him out of the ring and into a wall, bruising several ribs. Later that night, this would slow Mizuki down and allow for his capture by an Anbu squad, turning him directly over to Ibiki. 
weapons took a similar turn, with Naruto being just edged out by Sasuke. Afterwards, the class went back inside for the final phase, Jinjutsu and Ninjutsu testing. Okay Naruto, we will now be testing you on Jinjutsu and Ninjutsu. Please perform Henge, Kawarimi create 4 usable Bunshin, and dispel the Jinjutsu when you feel it take effect. Performing Kawarimi to perfection, for a genin, the examiners marked it down as a pass, even if it was against their will. As he performed Henge and became a perfect copy of Iruka, he felt the world disappear into blackness. Naruto tensed for only a moment before forming the correct seal and breaking the Jinjutsu. Good job Naruto, congratulated Iruka, now if you'll make four workable Bunshin, we can be on our way. Forming a familiar cross-shaped seal, Naruto intoned, Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Four Naruto clones poofed into existence, and the testers' collective jaws dropped. As one of the more bigoted Chuanin was about to protest, Naruto smiled sadistically, a smile he had learned from Anko. You know, you just said it had to be workable Bunshin. You never said I couldn't use a more advanced form. But if you want, I can do Mizu Bunshin. As he spoke, he formed the needed hand seals, and the pitchers of water drained and four more Naruto clones sprang into existence. So, do I pass? Iruka found his voice first. Yes, Naruto, you definitely pass. Here you go. He tossed a hitai to Naruto and smiled broadly. As Naruto ran from the room, he was faced with Ibiki, Anko, Tenten, Shikamaru, Chaoji, Ino, and Shino, all who looked like they were struggling with the decision over whether to hug him or hit him. A hit, Naruto scratched the back of his head and held up his new hitai eight. I passed. The next thing Naruto knew, he was being alternately strangled, hugged, and bombarded by questions by Anko, Tenten, and Ino. Ibiki chuckled, silently telling Naruto he was getting what he deserved, Shikamaru was muttering something about troublesome blondes, Chaoji smiled as he munched happily on a bag of chips, content that his friend was back, and Shino nodded imperceptibly and smiled, happy to see his friend again, though only Naruto or another Aburam would have caught it. Um, I know you probably want to know a bunch of stuff, but I don't want to talk about it here. We should probably go to the Hokage's office. Besides, he didn't get to hear everything yet, and he wants to, so I need to talk to him anyway. Once the group finally made it to the Hokage's office, held up by the girls seeing Gintoku and taking the required time to pet and coo over the fox, and Naruto trying to escape to go to Ichiraku's, Saratobi set up the privacy seals once more. Naruto started out with how he had gotten Tsune to come back, as they had seen her leaving for the hospital as they were entering the office, Tenten was practically frothing at the mouth to see her idol and hear how Naruto had brought her back. Though she wasn't happy to hear Naruto's nickname for her or the fact that Naruto was betting with the Sanin. Soon came the time for Naruto to release his illusion and he actively took away everyone's weapons this time. Tenten pouted a little, but Naruto wasn't about to take any chances. Everyone's reactions were different though. Another thing for the villagers to hate him for Anko. Well, I suppose it could be worse. And I always have said that he's an interesting guy Ibiki. How troublesome Shikamaru. At least he's really good at hiding it. But if anyone tries to mess with him, they go through me Chaoji. Those claws look like they would hurt. Maybe he wouldn't even need a weapon now. And now he's looking good wait a second. This is Naruto. Known him forever, not someone to think is cuter than if he is. Stop it. Tenten. Ooh, Naruto got hot. Wait. I love Sasuke. Damn it Naruto, stop distracting me. You know. I really wish he wouldn't make such a big deal out of it every time he shows people. Really, it's not that big a deal. And I'm getting hungry Gintoku. Exactly what does your hand you form entail? Shino asked, the only one not shocked speechless. Well, like I said, I'm half demon, so I smell like a half demon. It might get a bunch of animals to leave me alone, but it also attracts demons that might want to kill me. That's not good. But then again, Kanoha is in Fuzzy's territory anyway, so I doubt any demons are going to come after me here. Since it's really a result of me and Fuzzy being merged closer, we talk directly without having to meditate or be unconscious. And before you ask, Fuzzy doesn't like being called Fuzzy. He only puts up with it because the other option was furry, and he said that had some connotations that he didn't want any part of. Anyway, I've got better senses, I'm a lot faster and stronger, and I'm the holder of the Kitsune contract, which is cool because I'm the first one ever to hold that contract. And Toku yipped and Naruto looked down at him strangely. Oh yeah, I can also talk to foxes like the Inuzuka can talk with dogs, but I don't think I'm going to be using Gentoku in battle like they do. Maybe when he gets a little older. I don't want anything happening to him. Where did you meet Gentoku? Ibiki asked. Well, after the ritual, I was kind of just running on instincts for a month or so before I got my mind back in control. I don't really remember much of anything from then. When I woke up, I was living with a family of foxes way up north. When it came time for me to move on, Gintoku came with me. He's been with me ever since. Anything else you want to tell us? Saratobi asked, amused. Naruto screwed up his face in thought. 
I've figured out a better way for me to do my weight training, but that's all I think of right now. Maybe something later. Ibiki and Anko looked interested at a new training method their little brother devised. And just how is that, Atado? Naruto pulled off his shirt, revealing a well-toned body, and Tenten and Ino whimpered slightly. In the center of his chest, there was black seal that was familiar only to Siratobi. It's a modified gravity seal. Most of the time, gravity seals are used by people that travel a lot and have a lot of stuff to carry, but don't want to deal with all that weight, so they use one of these to take away some of the weight. Since this one is modified, instead of lessening the gravity, it makes it stronger. And the best thing is that it doesn't have the problems normal weight training does. All I have to do is channel the right amount of chakra through it, and it releases, so I don't need that pause in battle to take off the weights, and it never trains one part more than another, because it affects my whole body equally instead of weights that can get off balance. And since I don't need to worry about getting any more weights, I can save money. I think that's it anyway. Tsuritobi nodded, vaguely wondering where the blonde had found out about gravity seals. The concept had been tried before, but there was no one who could put up with the constant pressure without it. It either crushed them because they tried to move too fast, or their muscles and bones were rendered unusable because of the seals. Well Naruto, I may have more questions later on, but I can see you're itching to get out of here, and I have a great deal of paperwork to finish. So, unless you have anything else to say, you're free to go. Naruto nodded, put up his illusion once more, and sprinted from the room, Gintoku on his heels, and everyone chasing after him once they realized he had left. After a welcome back dinner interrogation party, Naruto had fallen asleep and barely woken up in time to sprint across the village. Tenten, Anko, and Ino had dragged him out the day before so he could get some new clothes, seeing as how everything else was now either too small for him or held together by the stains in the fabric. As such, he was now dressed in a pair of loose black pants with multiple pockets and scroll holsters running up and down the sides. He wore a pair of standard ninja sandals, and his top was the one concession he got from the female trio. He wore an orange button-down shirt that was a smooth material that was designed to catch and bind up projectiles before they could puncture too far and make removal easier. Naruto liked it because it felt nice. It wasn't like his old blatantly screaming orange jumpsuits, but a darker shade that looked good on the blonde. He also got a new trench coat in honor of Ibiki, though Anko would tell anyone who would listen that he wanted to be just like his big sister. And Toku sprinted next to Naruto, wearing a hit I ate that Naruto had convinced Saratobi to give him for his fox friend. His theory was that people would be less inclined to attack the small fox if it was obviously a part of their village. Not to mention that it just made his friend look a lot cooler. Naruto slid into the academy and sat down with barely a minute to spare. Of course, that was more than enough time for Naruto. Almost as soon as he sat down he felt a presence next to him. Oh hey Hinata. What's up? Hinata blushed profusely and started poking her fingers together. Anoit's G good to see why you back and Naruto K kun. Naruto looked confused for a moment, but smiled all the same. Well, it's good to be back, Hinata. Did you need something? Hinata froze, and her face went beet red. Ayano goodbye. That was weird, oh please, you tell me you still haven't figured it out by now. What are you talking about fuzzy? I swear, I don't know how I put up with you sometimes. I let you out from time to time, and yet at times it doesn't seem worth it. I can't believe you're this dense. Look over at the pale-eyed girl. Naruto looked over at Hinata, irritated that he was being ordered around, and curious as to what the fox demon was talking about. As soon as he saw the Hayuga heiress, she turned around from where she was looking at him, blushing, and poking her fingers together at mock speed. Okay what of it? You don't get it yet. Fine, I'll walk you through it. What is she doing? Blushing and poking her fingers together. But she always does that. No, if you bother to pay attention, in all the time you've known her, you would know that she only does that when she's talking with you. What does this tell you? Um, let's see, blushing, nervous, running away whenever she talks to me oh no. She's a pervert. A closet pervert. And she always seems so nice, too. What am I going to do now? Oh, this just got so much better. I can have fun with this offer her your body. You're not helping. You asked, and she could prove to bit of fun for you. But you know, she is the Hyuga heiress. A tiny position compared to the title of demon lord, but in your village, that title does carry some weight. I suggest doing something before she uses that to get to you. Like what? If I hang out with her, she'll just keep being a pervert. Seems like your problem to me. I suggest trying to be her friend and make it clear you just want to be friends and direct her somewhere else. She does look like she could be a little fun, but not suitable for a future mate. Not strong enough. Hey. She's plenty strong. I never said she wasn't strong. I said she wasn't strong enough. She'll battle to the death to protect something important to her, but she won't stand up for herself. Not strong enough. The girl with the weapons however, leave Tenten-chan out of this. And how do you know all that about Hinata, anyways? 
when you've been around as long as me, you learn how to tell things. Besides, I've known her just as long as you. Just because I pay more attention than you doesn't mean the information hasn't always been there. Naruto was pulled out of his thoughts by Aruka reading off the team listings. Team 7 will be Uzumaki Naruto, Haruno Sakura, and Ichiha Sasuke, led by Hada Kakashi. Naruto started cursing softly, and missed Kiba, Shino, and Hinata being placed together, and the Ino Shikacho team continuing. Naruto knew Kakashi was habitually late, Anko and Ibiki complained about it on a regular basis. He wasn't sure of how Kakashi viewed his status as the Kaiubi container, but if it was negative, Naruto wasn't looking forward to life as a genin. Though it made sense that Kakashi was leading the team, being the only person in Konoha with a Sharingan. Once Sasuke activated his, he would be the optimal person to teach him how to use it. Sasuke was not someone Naruto was happy about being on the same team as. He seemed to be just as big a bastard as he was before Naruto left, if anything it was worse. And Sakura wasn't helping matters by continually praising him and making him out to be the best. It just fed his ego. Naruto didn't want to be on the same team as Sakura, simply because while she may have been the top Kanoichi in the class, she was annoying as hell. Three hours later, Naruto had set up an extensive array of pranks for Kakashi when he finally showed up and rebuffed any and all questions about his time away from the village. The silver-haired Jounin finally showed up, though underestimating his team proved to be a mistake. Once all of Naruto's pranks had run their course, Kakashi was hanging upside down from the ceiling by one ankle, covered in feathers and glue, and had been pelted with erasers. My first Rikshoni hate you all. The three new genin sweat dropped at their sensei's pronouncement. Meet me on the roof in five minutes. First off, why don't you all tell me something about yourselves? Likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams, that sort of thing. Sakura spoke up. Why don't you go first sensei? Just so we know what you mean. Hmm, well my name is Hada Kakashi. I have likes and dislikes. Dreams well, I never really thought about it. Hobby essie would rather not tell you. Pinky, start. Sakura growled at the lack of information in her sensei's description. My name is Haruno Sakura, and my likes she looked at Sasuke and blushed, my hobbies she looked more intently at Sasuke, and a giggle escaped, my dreams she openly stared at Sasuke and tried to hide her giggles and the drop of blood that came from her nose. And your dislikes? Asked Kakashi, almost afraid, but wanting to get her off the tangent. Sakura glared at Naruto and audibly growled, making Kakashi sweat drop. Right. Fox boy, you go. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. I like Raymond, Anko Nichan, Ibiki Aniki, Tsunade Bachan, Shizu Nichan, Gintoku, all my other friends, trying to come up with new kinds of Raymond, like Rabbit Raymond, which is so good, and learning new jutsus. I dislike stuck up bastards like Sasu team, waiting for Raymond to finish cooking, and people who judge people without getting to know them first. My hobbies are training with my friends, learning new jutsus, and coming up with new ones myself. My dream is to be seen for who I really am and surpass all the hookages. Okay. Sunshine, your turn. My name is Ichiha Sasuke. I don't have many likes, and I dislike many things. My dream no, my ambition is to kill a certain man and revive my clan. Okay Kakashi thought, my team consists of an overdramatic Raymond obsessed idiot, a hopeless fangirl, and a brooding emo avenger. Something tells me they've lost already. Now that we know each other, we will be having a survival test tomorrow at 6. But Kakashi sensei, we've already done survival training. Sakura protested. Yes, but this survival test is to see if you're ready to become genin. What do you mean? We've already passed the exam. Right again Sakura. But just because you can pass a silly academy exam doesn't mean you're ready to be a genin. This test has a 66% failure rate, so there's a good chance you won't pass and you'll be forced to go back for another year. And from what I've seen so far, you'll all do better just to not show up tomorrow. Yeah right, we'll be there and we'll all pass, no matter what the test is, Naruto protested. Well, the idiot at least has some determination. I suppose that's your decision. But if you do decide to show up, be at the Memorial Stone at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, and don't eat breakfast if you don't want to throw up. With that parting shot, Kakashi disappeared in a puff of smoke. Naruto made his way towards his team's training ground, somewhat upset with himself. He had remembered Kakashi's advice to not eat, but only when he was halfway through breakfast. I can't believe I messed up instructions already. Calm down, you're overreacting. Look at it as if you had a brain. If the scarecrow is certain you'll throw up if you eat, you'll probably puke if you don't eat too. This way, you had enough so you aren't collapsing from hunger, and you haven't had enough so that you're dragging from too much food. You're prepared for either situation, so shut up and let me sleep. Naruto left the demon lord alone after that, not wanting to anger someone who had control over whether or not his body was flooded with yaki, he could push it back, but it would leave him tired and worthless for about a day and a half afterwards. He came to the training ground a few minutes after 6, and while Sakura and Sasuke were both there, Kakashi was not. 
taking the three-hour wait to be a hint of how long their sensei was going to be this time, Naruto told his teammates to wake him when their tardy sensei arrived and settled down for a nap. You're late. Sakura's scream woke Naruto and Gintoku, just in time to hear the beginnings of a poor excuse, before Sakura startled them from their feet with an overly loud liar. Bakashi didn't have a response to that and instead set down an alarm clock on the rock he was next to, pulled two small bells from his hip pouch and tied them to his belt. Okay, this test is fairly simple. All you have to do is get a bell by noon. Whoever doesn't get a bell will be tied to one of the stumps over there, denied lunch, while being forced to watch those who did get a bell eat and then sent back to the academy. But Kakashi sensei, there's only two bells. No matter what happens, someone is going to be sent back. Correct, the lazy Jounin confirmed cheerfully. And this isn't like any other tests you've had before. If you want a bell, you're going to have to come at me with intent to kill. However Kakashi was going to finish his statement, his genins didn't get to hear because he was cut off by a kunai thrown straight for his face. He plucked it out of the air and the next thing his team knew, he was standing behind Naruto, one of the blonde's arms in a painful looking lock and kunai to the throat. While your enthusiasm is appreciated, I haven't said go yet, Kakashi said calmly as Naruto struggled against the hold. Kakashi released him and was back in front of the group before they could blink. Like I said, you'll have to come at me with the intent to kill. Kunai, shuriken, anything you have. If you hold back, you won't be able to beat me. Kakashi gave one of his patented eye smiles. Go. Sakura and Sasuke both shot off into the woods, concealing their presences as best as they could, waiting for the best moment to attack. Naruto, however, just stood there, his face screwed up in concentration. Slightly shaken by the strange behavior, going by the file he had read on the boy, he had expected a flat-out charge, not deep thought, Kakashi pulled his favorite orange book from his hip pouch and started to read. After a minute or two, Naruto patted his leg for his fox to follow, and the duo walked calmly into the trees. Sasuke was dumbfounded as to what Naruto was doing, there was no way he was going to be able to beat Kakashi in a frontal assault. The doe probably figured his chances of getting a bell were zero and went off to sulk somewhere Sasuke thought. Though it's not like him to not even do something stupid. Hey, team, a voice whispered from over Sasuke's left shoulder. Ichi had jumped and turned to see Naruto crouching next to him. How did the dope get there without me noticing? Sasuke wondered with some alarm, but pushed it aside. What do you want? You're giving my position away. Naruto rolled his eyes, and Sasuke could swear the fox did too. He's a Jounin and a former Anbu captain. If he couldn't sense where you are before and I found you, he doesn't have a lot to teach us. As for what I want, I want to work together. Sasuke narrowed his eyes. Why should I work with you? Naruto thought the boy sounded faintly disgusted at the idea. Because, Naruto said, exasperated, he's a Jounin, and we're Jenin. Do you think he's going to be able to hold us off on our own? Our only chance of getting the bells is to work together. No, I'll get those bells by myself. I don't need anyone dragging me down. If I can't beat this guy, I'll never be able to beat him. Naruto crept off as Sasuke's thoughts took a turn for the homicidal, disturbed with his teammate's attitude. Sakura didn't know what to think about her blonde teammate. It was obvious he had some kind of mental deficiency, attacking their sensei like that and then just standing there in the open. Everyone knows that when you're faced with a superior opponent, the best thing you can do is outthink them. Not that Naruto would ever be able to do that with anyone. Sakura was brought out of her musings when a hand clapped over her mouth, pulling her back from her vantage point. A voice whispered in her ear, I'm going to take my hand off your mouth as soon as you stop struggling. Don't react or your position will be compromised. The voice did as it said and Sakura was free once she stopped moving. She turned around to face her captor. Naruto Baka. Sakura exclaimed in a harsh whisper. What are you trying to pull? You're going to give us away and I won't get to be on the same team as Sasuke Kun. Naruto ignored the comments. We need to work together. We won't get a bell otherwise. Sakura struggled with the concept for a moment before deciding on which way to go. No. I'll be able to get a bell much better than you, and if I do need to work with someone, I'll work with Sasuke Kun. He'll be much better help than you ever would be. Naruto exchanged an exasperated look with Gintoku before leaving the Kinoichi alone to her thoughts. The Kashi was wondering what his team was doing while he was reading. He was surprised he hadn't been attacked yet. He'd pegged Naruto as the impulsive type that would do something stupid like a head on assault. But barring that, he had expected for the Ichiha to try something by now. Though maybe Sasuke was waiting for one of the others to attack so he could slip an attack in unnoticed. And Sakura just didn't seem much for the offensive type. Wait. Leaves rustling over to the side. Naruto walked out of the brush, Gintoku at his side, guard down, wearing a slightly confused expression and holding no weapons. Hey Kakashi-sensei, I have a question. The copy nin was honestly surprised by that statement but didn't show it. Really? 
well, we're in the middle of an exercise, so it might be better if you wait until later, Kakashi said in his usual, slightly condescending but it's not meant to be tone of voice. Naruto scowled. You're our sensei, right? Yes, Kakashi answered hesitantly. That means you're supposed to teach us things, right? Generally, yes. The exercise we're in, we're supposed to learn something, right? Yes, Kakashi answered, gaining some confidence now. Well, then you should stop trying to deflect my questions and teach me like you're supposed to. Kakashi cringed. Fine Naruto, what's your question? What do you do if none of your teammates want to help you? What do you mean by that? The blonde sighed. I mean this exercise is obviously about teamwork. What do you do if none of your teammates want to work with you? Kakashi applauded the blonde mentally, but didn't give away anything on his face. Why do you think this exercise is about teamwork? Uh, Gen and teams always emphasize teamwork. And really, how were a bunch of fresh from the academy Gen and supposed to beat the famous copycat Kakashi one on one? The only way to win against you would be to work together, and even that would be iffy. You've been a ninja since you could barely walk, haven't you? Naruto earned himself an eye smile. Well, not quite that long, but close. Anything else? Well, the bell thing was designed to make us work against each other, since there was only two. But you're avoiding my question. How am I supposed to get my teammates to work with me? I doubt I can get another bell on my own. I suggest wait, did you just say get another bell? Naruto grinned broadly and pulled a bell out of his pocket. Yeah, I did. I must have missed the other way to get a bell, cheat. When did you take that? I don't remember you getting close enough to take one. Well, I didn't get close enough to you to take one, you got close enough to me. Remember, when you had the kunai to my throat and I was struggling around. It was then. I've been pulling pranks on experienced ninja since I was four. I've snuck around the Hokage Tower. I've gotten places I'm not supposed to be able to get to. I've been trained in stealth by Anko Ni-chan, who can, surprisingly, be quiet when she needs to be. You think I can't steal a bell when you're that close. But like I said, I don't think I can get that to work again. The Kashi was impressed against his will. I must say that was a good job. You used misdirection very well, and you made sure I underestimated you. But since you already have a bell, you can go do whatever you want. Naruto rolled his eyes. Fine, I'll play along. Gintoku and I are going to going to go catch a rabbit cause he didn't get any breakfast this morning. We'll be back soon. Akashi was disappointed. Sakura had been disabled by a simple Jinjutsu trap, and Sasuke was now buried up to his head. Only Naruto had figured out the true purpose of the test, and he had gotten a bell all by himself, which Kakashi was rather embarrassed about. Even after the blonde had spelled it out for the other two, they still failed. Watch a reading. Kakashi didn't jump at Naruto's voice next to him, though he was impressed the blonde had gotten so close before he noticed. It's a, it's a paradise. I think it might be a little bit much for you though. Maybe when you're older. Pervert book, I got it. They sat in silence for a moment. How'd the others do? Sakura's in a Jinjutsu trap, and Sasuke fell victim to a Doten Jutsu. Can I learn that one? Maybe later. What are you still doing here? The test isn't done yet, is it? Very good. I suppose not. I checked the other two, and they still don't want to work with me. Their kinda saw I got a bell before them. A pause. Well, Sasuke saw I got a bell before him. Sakura saw I got a bell before her precious Asuke-kun. I thought they might be. But you know, I've come up with a way to show you my teamwork on my own. Really? With your fox there? No, Gintoku's not much of a fighter. I have a better idea. Am I going to have to get up for this? If I do it right you will. Akashi sighed and put his book away. Naruto had already gotten one bell because he had underestimated the blonde, he wasn't about to do so again. They walked to opposite ends of the field, and Naruto smiled. No chance of you just giving me that bell, is there? I don't think so, Kakashi replied loftily. Even if I ask nicely? No. Page bunch and no jutsu. Fifty Naruto clones popped into existence and attacked. Some went high, some went low, some attacked from afar, and some were right in Kakashi's face, but the silver-haired Jounin wasn't nervous. He had beaten more enemies than this, and they weren't shadow clones. Behind his heart of clones, Naruto prepared his actual strategy. Kakashi destroyed the last of the cage bunshin that had been sent after him. He faced the true Naruto, who brought forth four more shadow clones. Kakashi smirked. If all Naruto was going to do was send wave after wave of cage bunshin after him, it wasn't going to work. The first clone flew forward with a punch, which Kakashi sidestepped right into the path of the second. The second clone was destroyed by a punch to the head, and the third was caught and whipped into the last clone. The original Naruto flew forward, hands fixing into a seal, and Naruto became a very attractive, very nude, female. Kakashi caught the lawn before anything adverse could happen. Naruto's female counterpart, Naruko, smiled foxily at Kakashi. You know sensei, you shouldn't let your opponent get behind you. Hanahagakur Haiden. Tojutsu Augi. 
Senen Garashi. The Naruto clone and Kakashi's whole turn to smoke as the Jounin flew across the open area, his ass screaming in pain. Just before he landed, Kakashi felt something brush against his belt. Looks like I win, Kakashi sensei. As the Cyclops looked up, he saw Gintoku padding over to Naruto, dropping a bell into the boy's outstretched hand. As Kakashi got up, he couldn't stop from asking. I thought you said your fox wasn't much of a fighter. Naruto laughed. Since when has a ninja told the truth about his abilities? And besides, Gintoku wasn't in the fight as a fighter, he just took the bell at the end. I didn't really lie about that did I? Kakashi's alarm went off. And it looks like you have some people to tie to stumps, don't you? Kakashi smiled under his mask. His students just looked so pathetic, tied to the posts. Sakura was struggling against the bonds, and Sasuke was brooding, red. Pouting. Naruto was eating his lunch happily, sharing some of it with Gintoku. So Naruto, what are you planning on doing with your bells? Kakashi asked, wanting to drill the point into his other two genin's heads just a little more. And he was fairly certain Naruto knew where he was going with it. Sure enough, two bells fell at the feet of his two bound genin, causing them to send confused looks at the blonde. What's this for? Sakura asked, suspicious. Oh come on, you mean you still haven't figured it out. And you were the smartest Kanoichi of our year. We're supposed to be a team. But why would you give us the bells after we kept refusing your help? Naruto snorted. Just cause I don't like you guys doesn't mean you deserve to go back to the academy. But if we don't end up working as a team soon, something will go bad and we'll end up dead. Sasuke snorted. Since when do you know all about ninja life, dope? Naruto fixed him with a glare. Since I've been on a training trip for the past six months and been traveling with the slug Sanin, Tsunade, for the past few weeks. You don't do that without learning something, team. So you weren't kidding yesterday when you said new Tsunade sama Kakashi mused. I had heard she was back in the village, but I never would have expected you would have been the cause. Sasuke was looking as arrogant as he could while tied to a tree. She probably just felt sorry for a dope like you. Naruto bit back the first four responses that came to mind. Instead, he taunted, just as long as you don't forget which one of is tied to a stump, you can think what you want. Naruto, you shouldn't talk to Sasuke-kun like that. Sakura yelled. You just got lucky because Sasuke-kun tired Kakashi-sensei out for you. That's the only reason you got a bell. Kakashi decided it was time to interrupt. Naruto had gotten the basic message across to his team, even if they didn't want to acknowledge it. Sakura, stop talking. Naruto tried to help both of you several times, even after he got a bell for himself and completed his mission. You refused. If you had worked with him, you probably would have gotten a bell. Naruto got both bells from me through a combination of my underestimating him and his teamwork with his shadow clones and fox. Sasuke and yourself failed to grasp the true lesson of the test, even after Naruto spelled it out for you. That is. Those who break the rules are considered trash, but those who abandon their comrades are less than trash, don't forget that. Before Sasuke or Sakura could protest any further, Kakashi, Naruto, and Gintoku left the training grounds, Sakura and Sasuke's lunches just out of reach. Kakashi ambled into the Jounin meeting, only 30 minutes late. Kurenai sent him a dirty look, but kept speaking. As I was saying, teammate earns a pass. Kiba and Akamaru worked well together and showed a proficiency in some his family jutsus, even if they do have a slight dependency on soldier pills. Shino made good use of his kikai bugs, using them in a number of different ways. Hinata has some confidence issues, but once those are worked out, she could prove to be a top kinoichi. Overall, I'm satisfied. Tsuritobi nodded and his son began his review. Team 10 looks like they're going to be another good Inoshikacho trio. Shikamaru is lazy, but he's smart enough so that doesn't matter much, and Ino can get him moving pretty well. Ino is kinda bossy, but the other two don't seem to mind much. And Chaoji gets along with both of them just fine. I approve. Saratobi turned a critical eye to Kakashi. And how did your team do? The Jounin in the back called out, come on, this is Kakashi, of course he failed them. I smile. Actually, Team 7 passes. Everyone perked up at that. The same voice in the back called out again. The Ichiha probably brought the rest up. No way any of the others could have done anything. Well, Sasuke is certainly talented. A lot of potential. I'm going to have to work with him a lot. He almost got a bell on his own. But he missed the point of the test. So did Sakura. What about the other one? No way he got it. Naruto ended up getting both bells actually. Sirotobi looked pleased. He got the first before I said go, when none of us were expecting. Then he figured out the only way he would get the second was with teamwork and made good use of Cage Bunshin to get it after the other two refused his offers of help. What's your final judgment? Saratobi asked. They have a lot to learn. Sasuke reminds me a lot of myself at that age, very focused and very talented. Once he awakens his bloodline, I'll have a lot more I'll be able to teach him. 
Sakura is a bit obsessed, but will probably do well as a support or Jinjutsu fighter after some training. And Naruto's pretty good already, but I don't know how long he'd last in a real fight, and he never would have gotten a bell if I were being serious. He seemed to rely too much on Cage Bunshin, and that's not a good way to fight. But all in all, they have the makings of a good team. They pass. Every Jounin in the room was surprised that Kakashi had finally taken a team, but they quickly moved on to more boring matters. Ibiki was waiting for Naruto when he got home. I hear you passed your test this morning. Congratulations. Kakashi has never passed a team before, but I suppose I should have expected it from Kanoha's number one most surprising ninja. Naruto snorted as he collapsed in a chair. Training after the exam had been hard. You should have known better than to doubt me. I am going to be Hokage, after all, Naruto explained in a matter-of-fact tone. What test did he give you? Some stupid bell test. Ibiki's face was one of schooled non-reaction. And how did your team do? Lots of teams have failed that one in the past. Naruto shook his head. Fuzzy figured out the real purpose of the test pretty quickly, but the team and Sakura wouldn't listen to me. Course it helped that Bachan had told me about her bell test with the old man when we were coming back to the village. Ibiki could only shake his head. The next month progressed slowly for Naruto and company. The new genin spent their days doing repetitive D-rank missions and training. Naruto's days were more filled than anyone else's it seemed, as he simply had more instructors than anyone else. Early morning had Naruto dodging Tsunade's punches and doing insane chakra control exercises, such as dodging kunai during a water walking session, while holding 16 leaves to different points on his body with chakra. Then he was off to the bridge to wait for Kakashi with the rest of Team 7. After it was found that Kakashi was three hours late every day, Kaiubi told Naruto to go off into the woods to practice if all he was going to do was sit there and do nothing. Once Kakashi finally showed up, the afternoon was spent doing D-rank missions. After a quick refueling at Ichiraku's, Naruto trained with Anko, Ibiki, Tsunade, or his friends until after dark. Then get up the next day and do it all over again. But after a particularly annoying cat retrieval mission, Naruto was fed up. So when the Hokage tried to give them another D-rank, Naruto said no. I can't believe this old man. We've been doing these stupid missions for a month. We're ready for a C-rank. We've done more than the required missions, and that cat keeps mauling me. Give us a C-rank or no mission at all. Naruto crossed his arms defiantly. Only to be sent to the floor by Aruka's fist. Naruto. You can't talk to the Hokage like that. Apologize. Suratobi held up a hand and chuckled. Don't worry Aruka-kun. I know Naruto-kun means no disrespect. And I myself have been wondering why they haven't requested one yet. Bakashi looked as if he was mulling it over. Well, they have done the required number of missions. I suppose they're ready. Alright. Suratobi smiled. Wonderful. I have a C-ranked escort mission to wave country here for you. Okay, Tazuna, come on in. An old man with a paunch and carrying a bottle of sake strolled in. What? These brats are supposed to be the ones to protect me? I doubt they could protect a sandwich, much less a master bridge builder like myself. Naruto jumped back up. Take that back you old drunk. We're fully qualified genin of Kanahagakur. Azuna snorted. Yeah right. You're probably the weakest one of the group, a loud mouth like you. Why couldn't I get a group of real ninja? Bakashi spoke up. I assure you Tazuna-san, they are real ninja and will be more than enough to protect you. And if not, I'm a Jounin and I will be there to make sure nothing happens. HMPH. Whatever. Just make sure I don't die. Meet at the village gates at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning for the start of the mission. That is all, Saratobi stated, his tone saying clearly that the matter was over and carrying the authority that a Hokage has. Naruto walked into the Yamanaka flower shop, smiling when he saw the person he was looking for. Ino-chan. The blonde looked up from her magazine, she had been bored out of her mind with nothing to do and no customers. Oh, hey Naruto-kun, what do you need? Naruto scratched the back of his head and laughed sheepishly. Um, well I kinda need you to do a favor for me. Ino looked at Naruto appraisingly, Naruto never was this shy about asking for something before. He usually asked loudly and without any kind of hesitation, so this had to be something big. What is it? Naruto blushed and muttered something Ino couldn't quite hear. What was that? I couldn't hear you. Naruto mumbled slightly louder, but still too soft for Ino to hear. Damn it, speak up Naruto, you're always loud, and you choose now to try to quiet down. Jeez, Ino ranted as she shook her head. Naruto's blush was intense as he looked Ino square in the eye and asked in a small voice, Ino-chan, can you please take care of my plants while I'm not here? I've got a mission out of the village. What? Your plants? Ino questioned loudly, causing Naruto cover her mouth with his hands and look around frantically. Hmm, his hands feel really nice Ino thought absently. Do you want the whole village to know? And you said I was loud, so where is this coming from? Ino asked. I've known you since we were seven and you've never mentioned anything like this before. I've had plants since I five, Naruto grumbled. 
I couldn't have a pet, so I got plants. I got an actual garden when I moved when I was 7, and that's what I'm asking you to look after. I never told you guys because you would have teased me about it. Happy now? Eno was smiling broadly. That wasn't so hard, was it? Why do you even need me to watch them anyway? Can't the people you live with do it? And Nikki has to work in the interrogation most of the time, so he can't do it, and the last time I tried to get Anko Nichan to help me, they were all almost dead when I got back. And I was only gone for two days that time. And Bachan and Shizu Nichan are too busy at the hospital to do it. Besides, you're the best person with plants I know. Please do it, please Eno-chan. Naruto punctuated his statement with a look that immediately hooked her, whether she wanted to or not. Fine, but only if you do something for me, Eno said imperiously, hoping to save as much face as she could. I do it, whatever it is, I promise Eno-chan, and you know I don't go back on my word. Fine. When you get back, you have to go out on a date with me, Eno smirked. Nani. A date. Why? I thought you were a Sasuke fangirl. Eno shuddered. Well he had been, until my parents tied me to a chair and pointed out all the things that make him a bad boyfriend. After a while, I couldn't dispute the facts. Sasuke isn't good boyfriend material. He is still pretty hot though. Naruto nodded. It was good to know his friend wasn't going to rant about the virtues of the last Ichiha anymore. Okay, thank you so much for this. I'll take you on the best date ever when I get back from my mission. Um, one thing, Naruto-kun, Ino said, her turn to feel embarrassed. I've never actually been to your house. Where is it? I know it's kinda far out there, but I don't know for sure. Naruto smacked himself in the forehead. He had never had his friends over for two reasons. One, the truly massive amount of traps set up in the surrounding forest. Two, everyone else lived farther in town, so it was easier for everyone to get to one of their places instead of his. Oh, well, just find Ibiki Aniki or Anko Nichan and get them to show you. If you can't find them, just ask Aruka sensei He knows how to get past all the traps. The two blondes said their goodbyes, and Naruto started to leave, only to stop at the door and smile. You know Ino-chan, if you really wanted a date, all you had to do was ask. I'm not like Team. Before she could say anything, he was gone. The next morning, Team 7 waited for their sensei quietly. Sakura had been pestering Sasuke, but the look the gate guards had given her had shut her up rather effectively. Sasuke was brooding, and Naruto was trying to take a nap. They were leaving the village, and Naruto wanted to sleep as much as possible while still on friendly territory, his recent training trip demonstrating to him that sleep might not always be possible, so it was better to get it when you could. The Kashi showed up half an hour late, showing that he was taking this seriously, being that close to on time. Naruto grumbled about not having enough time for a good nap, but placed Gintoku, still sleeping, around his neck and moved along with his team, chatting happily. Shut up brat, you're annoying me, Tazuna grumbled after an hour of walking. And aren't ninjas supposed to be quiet or something? Hey. I'll do as I want. Besides, if I wasn't talking, we would be bored and tense and testy. I'm just doing the whole group a favor. As Naruto ranted, the group passed an innocent looking puddle on the side of the road, none of the genin noticing it. The Kashi, however, did, and so wasn't nearly as surprised when two black clad forms charged them. He did a quick kawarimi and watched the battle unfold, wanting to see how his students would perform. One down, the demon brothers said in unison. Sakura froze upon seeing her sensei rip to shreds. One of their attackers moved towards her and Tazuna, and she shakily drew a kunai. But relief flew over her face as Sasuke appeared in front of her. The last loyal Ichiha had deflected the missing nin's clawed gauntlet and expertly threw a shuriken to pin the chain against a tree. The duo grimaced under their masks and twisted the chain, snapping it under the pressure. They could handle the brats without their best weapon. The blonde would be easy, and the one who trapped their chain would be next. Then they could kill the target and have some fun with the girl. Naruto looked at his attackers. As soon as he saw their eyes, he knew this wasn't just any fight. The scratched Hitai ate clued him in, but their eyes glinted with bloodlust. They weren't just after one of them. They wanted the whole group dead. Naruto cursed. The blonde Jinchuriki snarled as the larger one charged him, a kunai clashing against a poison gauntlet, giving Naruto the extra second necessary to land a knee to the assassin's face. Sasuke twisted to avoid the freak's claw swipe, bringing his kunai up to a guard position. He launched a punch at the man's ribs, but ended up hitting only tattered cloak. The Ichiha moved awkwardly to prevent him from being skewered by his opponent. Sasuke sank into a crouch to get out of the range of the weapon and shot forward the next second, sinking his fist into the man's gut. The two brothers leapt back, side by side once more, ready to attack with one of their more potent tag team assaults. They just couldn't believe that a bunch of brats like these would make them have to pull out one of their more advanced moves. Well, they were planning on attacking until Kakashi appeared behind them and knocked both of them out with two simple strikes to the neck. What the hell were you doing, you one-eyed bastard? 
Naruto raged as soon as he saw his sensei dispatch the two missing men. Well, I wanted to see who they were after, and I wanted to see how my students would do in a real combat situation. Those guys were going to kill us, and you left us on our own. Oh, poor Dobe, afraid you were going to get hurt. Sasuke taunted. Can't do anything without someone holding your hand. Then Toku bared his teeth and growled, and Naruto realized he wasn't far from doing that himself. He turned to Kakashi again. Do you know how strong the poison on those claws is? It's so strong it's burning my nose from all the way over here. If one of us got that in our system, we probably would have died in minutes. What then, just cause you wanted to see how we would do. You know, you would have been fine. Any poison would have been burned out of your body before anything could happen. Shut up, I'm making a point. And if one of the others got poisoned, they wouldn't be so lucky. Besides, they can't hear you. Bakashi gave an eye smile. Don't worry Naruto, I would have intervened before anything too bad could have happened. Naruto scowled and Gentoku turned his ire to the Jounin. Maybe. But when Sakura froze, Sasuke was the one who saved her, not you. And just cause those guys were after the old drunk does not mean they weren't going to kill us too. They wanted to kill us. I've seen those eyes too often to not know what they meant. They thought they had killed you and were planning on killing us. The Kashi shrugged. As I said, if things became too serious, I would have intervened. As it was, you appeared to have everything under control. I needed to see just who they were after, and this was the most beneficial way. Don't worry about it. But for now, we need to get these two tied up and Thentazuna, and I need to have a talk. The old drunk gulped. And it's cause of Gato that we couldn't afford anything more than a C-ranked mission. I'm sorry I lied to you, but if I don't make it there safely and finish building the bridge, the entire country of Wave is doomed. I understand if you don't want anything else to do with me. Tazuna wasn't being overdramatic or playing up the situation. He sounded disappointed in himself for putting people in this situation, but more so than that, he sounded like a man defeated. Well, seeing as how you lied to us and this mission is above the parameters for a new gen and team such as this, we are fully within our right to leave you here right now, Kakashi stated. I understand, Tazuna sighed. Naruto had other ideas. No way. We can't abandon him like this. We can't abandon our mission like that. Actually, Naruto, nothing would happen if we left this mission right now, Kakashi reasoned. As long as we explained the situation to the Hokage, there would be no negative repercussions. You're right. First mission out of the village and we quit just cause something new pops up. Besides, what happens to the old drunk if we quit? You just ready to let him die. Because you didn't think we were ready. What happened to our sensei who let us watch him die before handing us off to opponents that might have been able to kill us instantly? I say we keep going on the mission. Sasuke and Sakura voiced their agreements, and Kakashi didn't really have much choice but to let the team keep going. But the Demon Brothers were Chunin, at best. Their next opponent would be a Jounin, without a doubt. This mist is so thick Sakura marveled as they drifted silently towards the shore. Yeah, and we're using it to not been seen by any of Gato's men. But that only works if we don't make any noise, either, the man driving the boat said quietly, but sternly. Five minutes later, the boat had landed, and the man who gave them passage departed, leaving the group in the mist. A short distance inland, Kakashi felt a chakra signature tickling his senses. It flared and his visible eye widened. Down. He ordered as a thrown zambado flew over their heads and stuck itself into a nearby tree. A shirtless nin with a face covered in bandages appeared standing on the blade. Well, what do we have the nin started before Naruto cut him off? What the hell? Naruto saw the bandaged nin. Zabuza. What are you doing here? And why did you try to kill me? Naruto turned to shout to the forest. Haku, where are you? Come out here and tell me what's going on. I know I won't get anything from Momo over here. Bakashi looked pissed. He had absolutely no idea what his student was doing, but it was most likely going to get them killed. You never taunted the enemy unless you had the power to back it up, and there was no way Naruto would be able to beat the demon of the mist. What the hell do you think you're doing? He hissed. Do you want us to die? Truthfully, Kakashi wasn't sure he would be able to beat the Nuke Nin, but if he had a partner or one of his students got in the way, Runt? But you? What the fuck are you doing here? Weren't you still in the academy when I last saw you? Kakashi was now confused. Naruto. The person wearing a Kiri Hunter Nin mask jumped down from a tree and appeared next to Zabuza. It is good to see you again, Naruto-san. What are you doing here? We're on a mission. Why did I have to get sealed in such an idiot? Brat, you know you should probably clue the tall one in before he tries to kill you. He's looking at us strangely. Naruto, explain, Kakashi ordered. What? Zabuza and Haku are my friends. Kakashi narrowed his eyes. You are friends with an A-class nuke nin. Yeah. He trained me some when I went out on my training trip. He's got some really cool water jutsus. Haku spoke before Kakashi, who was looking at- I'm not sure I believe that. What would a kid not even out of the academy have to do with one of the seven swordsmen of the mist? 
precisely. A kid not even out of the academy wouldn't be able to betray anything we wouldn't be able to find out on our own. But Naruto has also stayed loyal to his village. Or do you doubt someone you have trained yourself? Then what are you doing here? Zabuza smirked under his bandages. We were hired to kill the old man. Bakashi glared. I'm afraid I can't allow you to do that. Haku, didn't you talk any sense into him? Haku sighed. You know as well as I that it can be very difficult, Naruto-san. Naruto snorted. Yeah, he is an idiot about this kind of stuff. So what about it Zabuza, are you going to try to do what you were hired to do, or what you want to do? Or aren't you the big bad demon of the mist that won't let anyone tell him what to do anymore? Zabuza growled. Look, runt, are you going to let the little guy get kicked around again? Before anyone could do anything about it, Zabuza had punched Naruto into the ground. Damn it runt, I'm just trying to stay alive. You think I want to help him? No, no I don't. He's keeping the hunter nin away from me and Haku. Well, work with us then, Naruto said, as if it settled everything, as he picked himself up off the ground. Make sure nothing happens to Tazuna, and then we won't have to worry about Gato anymore. Besides, how likely is it that he's planning on paying you anyway? This was definitely something Zabuza had come across before. Missing Nin were usually hired by people who were criminals themselves, and that often meant missing Nin didn't get paid. Zabuza growled, but didn't say anything as he mulled the offer over. And besides, you still owe me for getting you food for all that time I trained with you. Not to mention that bunch of hunters I distracted, Naruto reminded. Zabuza knew Naruto was right. Not about the food thing, but not being paid by Gato. You're distracting those hunters nearly got me blown up, runt. And you got that food for us just to have pleasure of working with me, he taunted, before resolving. Fine, I'll work with you. I didn't much like that bastard anyway. Kept trying to insult me. As if I couldn't kill him and his entire army without breaking a sweat. Bakashi nodded. Good. I don't trust you, but we need to keep moving in case Gato sent any other assassins. We can continue this discussion later. And you can tell us all you know about Gato and what he's capable of. I believe you mentioned an army. What if Naruto trained by Ibiki for Chunin exams harem? Thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.